cameras in our helicopters. Mm. So, which should be interesting. Oh, big time. I, I don't know what's going on anymore. Right. Okay. So what what I'm going to do? I'm just going to I'm just going to do my usual uh, thingy on you, and then we'll, we'll get started. I just got to set something up a minute. It's a shame there's no David tonight. Oh, and obviously no Drina, which is a shame. So uh, we're we're hoping to get Drina back soon. Not really. No, she's having an operation either uh, Thursday oh. or Saturday, and they've told her it'll be some kind of weeks before she's able to do anything. So I don't know. Doesn't sound likely. I feel I feel, I feel a bit awkward because she's um, she's paid her money. Mm. <clears throat> well, to sort of keep it in abeyance or something. Yeah, I would. Because yeah, I'm sure and when then, she comes back, she'll want you know, to join let in her again. Use it up when she comes back. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Okay. Well, what we'll, we'll do? We'll uh, we'll start sending notes to her then. Uh, hang on a minute. Hang on a minute. Before I start <coughs> sending any notes to her, right? Is she able to read the notes? I would think so. She certainly because she's answering her phone and she's got. Oh, okay. the, she would get that go on her phone, wouldn't they? All right, then I'll say. Well, I'll, she's only she's only been away this month, hasn't she? So um, I'll, I'll yeah. just I'll, I'll just send her the notes from this month. Yeah, mm, she's not at home yet, is she? Oh no. God, no, she's not. She oh, won't be at home it? for a while because, uh, no. as I say, she's not able to she do can't anything. Drive, no. So is anyone picking up a post? No, but I was I was thinking about that and I was also thinking that when she's feeling a bit better, I could sort of drive her up and she could come and meet all her mates here that she's yeah, yeah. not seeing. But I think she's got to get somewhat better before Which, we can think about it. Thank you, love. Right, okay. Right, okay, then let, let's have let's have news this week. Anyway, give her give her our love. I would say let's try and get right, her well, some I flowers. Did, I did last week. Yes, I did send, give her your love. Thank, thank you, Anne. Yeah. Well, particularly mine more than Andy's because uh, it means more <laughs> for me. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> no, Andy, I don't take it personally, love. So um, I, I I know the truth. <laughs> yeah, but which, but but the thing is, which Pete which Pete do we send a love from? All of them. Right, before you start any more of your nonsense, right, Margaret, <laughs> shut up. Um, <laughs> right, okay. Uh, talking about nonsense, Margaret, any news from you this week? No, I don't think I've got anything, actually. I did, ah, oh, yes, I did think I saw a burial mound up on Church Fell, which is behind Sizer Castle. I thought no, that, that doesn't look natural. Quite right, possibly. Uh, I, know, I know there are there is stuff up there. There is. Um, yeah. This was on the bit going down to Brigsteer, and it was a mound, and it had yeah. rocks placed on it. Although there are no rocks anywhere to be seen around it, it just stood out to me as being rather unusual. Well, if if, if you can get us an exact location or, or a little sketch, then me and Andy can look into it. Yeah, well, I took some photographs, but they don't look like anything on my phone. But, um, yeah, it definitely looked not normal, not natural. I think, I think, this, I think that uh, defines the group that we're involved in here. <laughs> uh, right. Um, talk, talking about not natural, um, Anne? No, I have no news this week. Right, OK, right. Let, let's just get one of the bloody Peters out of the way. One of them. Go on. <laughs> Wait a minute. We were choosing names. You were going to get that right now. They can be look, called look, different look, names. Look, <laughs> look, before I have any more of your nonsense, right, let's just have one of the Peters. <laughs> well, I got all my news from my newsletter. My newsletter arrived, and you know everything that's in that newsletter, so I don't have any news. Oh, right. Now I'm, now I'm bloody am confused. Right. Okay, I'm glad you got that. Right, so... OK, what we should do, right? Ah, no, that's what we'll do. The first Peter that talks is the Peter that talks the first. And the second Peter that talks is the second Peter that talks after the first Peter. Right, so the other Peter. No, nothing for me. I admit I... <laughs> right, that, 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 that's, I think, I think we've got a good sort of thing going now. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. <laughs> Andy, Andy, Adam, are you sure you haven't changed your name to Peter? <laughs> that would make three of us, though. 
Way too confusing. <laughs> I, I, I had a class once with three Chrises. One was a bloke, and there was two women yeah. called Chris. Uh -huh. I tell you what, that was that was a very confusing class. Yeah. Um, right, talking about witches, Pat. No, sorry, nothing. Did you see did you see this? She just took that, it just went over her head then. Um, <laughs> Andy. No, I was watching that. Um, is it what's it called? The flying archaeologist do the night. Oh, right. yeah, cool. seen it. And I think it's on channel four. And he'd been flying over and they found a new a new hen, a, a new burial mound, a very large one near a stonehenge, hmm. which I thought was really interesting. I like and uh, it showed up as a crop mark on an aerial photograph a couple of years ago. And they went and investigated and did some geophys and then excavated. And it's one of the biggest ones they've come across. Hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. Neolithic. Oh. Mm -hmm. got, well, I got, I got, I'm glad you got your, your your time periods right there, Andy. Yeah. It's fine. Yeah. yeah. It's fine. So, uh, but I was so surprised. We, yeah, seeing how much work had been done around Stonehenge that yeah. nobody had noticed a very <laughs> big burial mound. You're like you're talking, you know, a couple hundred meters. It was massive. They actually, it was so big that I think they missed it because it looked like a contour of hillside. Um, you know, you know, talking talking about prehistoric stuff. You know, I really got on my wick the other day, right? I, I, I'm, I'm a member. I'm a member of um, one of those elite yeah. societies in archaeology. It's not the, uh, it's it's not the, um, um, uh, you know, Scottish it's antiquarians. It's not them, right? It's yeah. not them, right? right. It's it's another organisation. And I was going through the catalogue, right? You know, uh, you know, the, the, this little. Um, newsletter they sent out, which was really useful. And it said, oh, we, the grants that we've given this year. So I was looking through it and I thought, why does Mike Parker Pearson need £2,000? Right. You know what I mean? I'm just thinking these guys are so, have got so much money being thrown at them and they, and they, 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 they snapple a grant off this organisation. Okay. Yeah. And, I, and, I, and I'm just <laughs> thinking, I'm just thinking, you know, it seems to be that everyone seems to grab everything and, you know, and, and everybody else seems to have to go out and struggle. You know? Anyway, I thought I'd have a moan there, Andy. I don't even know why I said that. Oh, yeah, Neolithic, Mike Parker Pearson, Andy. That's what it was. Yeah, that's all right. I know, so I, know, I know you love him. <laughs> Can't stand the guy. Right, OK. <laughs> um, right, so has David just joined us as well? He has. I let him in. Uh, uh, Hi, that's, David. That's, Thank you. That, that, Hello, that's good. Is your arm better? Is your arm okay? No. Oh. <laughs> you haven't? Oh, Ooh. dear. That's your drinking arm as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. Oh, that's not good. That, that, that's not good, is it? Right. Uh, um, oh, by, by the way, I've been saving toads recently. Yeah, oh, yeah. So I, I've, I've past three nights, I've been, I've been saving toads on the road. Um, uh, yeah, and I, I've been, I've been putting them in a nice safe pond. Anyway, so right, so I decided, right, um, I, 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 and this is a lot to do with a little bit of feedback that you guys seem to give me in the classes. You know, oh God, you know, we're doing that and whatever. You know, I like the second part and I like the first pit and whatever. So I thought, right. We're going to have four parts to every lecture now, right? Um, so, you know, you bounce are like two bits of it, right? So this is what we're going to do. So what what it, what it is, the first one, uh, the first one comes along the back of somebody talking about um, a site in Ireland. So I've done a little bit of research about a site in Ireland, right? Um, and it took me to this site, right? But before I got to this site, I, I was then interested in another site that's got a lot of history on it, like Neolithic, um, all the way to sort of fairly post-medieval in Ireland. You don't do a lot about Ireland. So, so that's what that's that's a, we're gonna do a little bit of that today. And then we're gonna go on to um so two sites in Ireland, one one's Neolithic and the other one's a bit of mix, like this one, like the image in front of us. The other one we're going to come across is is somebody else has requested this. Uh, they, it, it, it's actually really similar to you know when we were talking about for, um, souterrains 
of foggy holes in Ireland, um, in Cornwall, and we did two, two terrains on Orkney. Well, these are den holes. Oh, no, not these. Right. Oh, God. No, hang on. Um, we're going to look at these, uh, which is a den hole, right, which I'd never come across. And these holes, some of them might go all the way back to the uh, Neolithic period. So I'll do an overview of these. Then we're going to do the topic that we were meant to be doing tonight, Otzi the Iceman. But we're not going to do all of Otzi the Iceman tonight. We're going to do a bit of a bit of an overview and then we're going to leave it. Right. And then. Uh, we're going to do, we're going to look at a hen site, um, which takes us back to a site known as Norton. So, so there's four big chunks that we're going to do today. So if we go back now, right, and again, this is the site I was initially going to be interested in, right? But then before that, I, I started reading about this site. Uh, it's, it's a, it's a multi-period site in Ireland. Uh, I wanted to <coughs> look at this. And as I said, I, I thought it, it would it would be very it would be a very nice thing to um, try to sort of mix this a little bit um, each week. So this is an image of a site that is basically above a Neolithic site in North Cork. And the headlines are archaeologists uncover 5,700 year old 5,700 year old Neolithic house in North Cork. As one thing that one thing that I, I fail to sort of mention each week, which which I, I, I take for granted, is that when archaeologists excavate a Neolithic site, uh, they're usually going through other layers of history to actually get to it. I know that sounds really obvious, but archaeology is destructive. So you've got to destroy material above to get to other material and then get to other material and then get to Neolithic material, right? And there's a bit of a word of warning there. When people talk about we've got a Neolithic site, there might be something underneath it, like a Mesolithic site. This is what I was saying last week with the Ness of Brodger excavations on Orkney, where there we've got Neolithic stuff underneath that, and they really wanted to find it. And this site in Ireland is not just Neolithic, as we've said. The other headline news are uh, finds associated with burials or offerings to the gods of the underworld, and sort of. Eight separate excavations were carried out after the county council undertook two road alignment projects um, in uh, North Cork, in Mallow and Michelson Town, and those other two there, which I'm not going to pronounce. So when they really got digging into this site, when they really got sort of excavating into this site, and this goes back to 2020, August 2020, but it's very relevant to us because we're talking about Neolithic. Um, the foundations of a 5,007 year old um, Neolithic house was found. Uh, before they got to the Neolithic house, they found evidence of Bronze Age burials. Above that, they found evidence of Iron Age smelting. All discovered on this one site associated with these two roads that are being realigned uh, in County Cork, Ireland. Now, I do listen to people and they say, oh, you know, we need to do other parts of this and that. And I thought, right, we really never do enough about Ireland. When they were looking across this landscape, um, eight separate excavations associated with the N73. On one of the sites, archaeologists discovered the foundations of a Neolithic house dating back to approximately 5,700 years ago. And what we're going to do, we're going to basically say, similar to this, similar to this, but this is that other site that opened me up into doing the research for today. And it's always this that this belonged to an explosion of Neolithic 
activity in this part of Ireland. As we know, Ireland itself demonstrates a very high level of culture from very early on, going all the way into the Neolithic period. I'm not going to make the statement um, that we found these buildings, and it's the first time that we got farming and agriculture in Ireland, 5,700 years ago. I'm not going to say that, but what I am going to say is that Ireland itself is really a place that people are starting to get it, get to the nitty gritty and start to understand. So the rural landscape, the rural hinterland, the rural expanse is very much what we see in Ireland today, as much as what we saw in the past. Pottery, stone tools and grain from the same period were also discovered at the site. And when you, inter when you, when you look at it, this, um, you, you, start, you start to find um, the real sort of focus of community, Neolithic settlers from other areas, pottery, distinctive stone tools, and you start to actually really think about um, um, other little weird facets. I've got any images of this, but, you know, they're, they're talking about pottery deliberately buried in holes. What's that about? Is it about rituals? Is it about um, gifts to gods of the underworld? That's one thing that now this is what this is why I thought, you know, wouldn't it be good to just have a little look at these Denny holes? Because if we're thinking about gods to the underworld, we're digging holes into the ground and putting pottery in them in the Neolithic period. Let's think about a little bit more deeper when we think about the when I say Denny holes, I mean Dean holes, but Denny holes sounds better. Dean holes in Essex and elsewhere. But we're still back in Ireland, aren't we? And you know, when 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 we think about when we think about archaeology, we 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 mustn't ignore the more modern facets of archaeology, like those layers before you get to the Neolithic. We think we think about we think about history and archaeology as not just only buildings, but charcoal pits and various dikes. We're we're, we're thinking about again charcoal, and we're thinking about um, charcoal um, is a very um, very important indicator of changing um, uses of, of, of woodland and, and, and sort of changing wood uh, uses of what metal tools that they might use instead of using flints like this. Um, and we're really starting to see at this site that um, they're, they're very much at this very site again, before we get to the Neolithic period, at this very site again, uh, we're starting to see um, charcoal burning, uh, charcoal burners, charcoal pits. Um, and again, this sort of wonderful thing, um, evidence of iron smelting, obviously not in a Neolithic period, but in the good old Iron Age over 2000 years ago. Smithy sites were found at both this site and, and probably all the way into the 1600s. So again, we're thinking about Ireland itself with these types of sites. Uh, indicating uh, lots of levels of communication and trade and routes. And uh, they're, they're saying that um, maybe, maybe um, because this was along a main route through, through County Cork, they, they believe that the um, metal smithian may have actually been to do with making shoes for horses um, and various metal tools for farming. And you know, the, the again, sort of, again, sort of giving you a texture of, of when before you get, before you get to the um, Neolithic period, obviously the good old clay pipe, this, my, my, the notes in front of me tell me this, um, this probably dates to about the 1600s, let's be a bit more specific, late 1600s. Um, and they're talking about um, other clay pipes and various glass being found at the site. And again, I, I just wanted to implore upon you that archaeology is not just about a period in time. It's about lots of periods in time. And those that have followed my classes um, um, following the, the work of Tim Ingold and following the line and seeing how every single sort of 
intermingles, everything sort of starts to become very transitional and things mix and spread without periods. And there's, there's never such a period that sort of people stop using iron after they come across it. They continually use an iron and sort of flint is used throughout the periods, everything sort of transitional movement and all the layers sort of mix into one, really. And again, it's good to remember that. And, you know, I, I, I you know, what I'm going to do is be a little bit critical of time team for once. And I shouldn't be right. But um, the unfortunate nature of time team, they had to dig in three days. So it was usually that they would just um, take off the topsoil and the other layers and just go straight down to the Roman stuff or the or the medieval stuff or the prehistoric stuff that they needed to get to. And usually all these sort of nuanced little bits of archaeology, like the clay pipe from a more recent period, were lost in the transcripts the time team has now become. Do you know, I I, I was looking through my emails and uh, today and I thought, right, I, I was sent a wonderful email from Henry, um, who who does the Wednesday. And uh, Henry said, look, you know, what about looking? What, what about looking at this? Right. And I thought, right, I'm going to look at this purely Neolithic site. Right. So we've got nice few ditches there. We've got sort of a strange Neolithic looking structure. Um, what's probably going on there is if I if I want to sort of dress this, um, that circular building there in the middle is probably later. You can see it's a little bit more clearer. And then the building, the two linear lines towards the right represent um, an earlier building. Um, and you know this, and you've got ditches and various other things and various post holes and various other features across the archaeology. And interestingly enough, can we just can we just look at this a minute, right? The Neolithic archaeology is very close to the surface. Very close to the surface. That means that where we look at the other site that we've just looked at in County Cork in Ireland, that you've got various different layers of archaeology, sort of 1600s, going all the way down to the Neolithic, going through the Iron Age, you know, different layers, you know, different sort of layers of archaeology. But sometimes the prehistory, the Neolithic stuff, is so, so close to the surface. So you just scrape it and you come across the uh, you come across the Neolithic world. And that's very interesting because in various different parts of the country, Roman archaeology might be three or four, five, ten meters deep, for example, in the city of London. And then you might go down the road. Some of the Roman archaeology is a foot below the surface. Neolithic archaeology might be two or three meters deep. In this case, inches below the surface. All, all these sort of nuanced little things with archaeology tell us that archaeologists does never, archaeology never really has a set pattern of offering us detail. And when we look at the art of the ice, ice man in a very short period of time, again, Otzi the ice man, what a very complicated individual he turns out to be. And again, I wanted to reiterate that 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 do we not see the Iceman this week was, was just to sort of give us a taste for him. And then we can sort of look at all the tattoos and sort of other things that have been found with him. And we'll look at that again, but that won't be next week, but we're doing our art see the Iceman um, um, in a very short time. So this, this article that I've got it is entitled uh, Archaeological Excavation Report. And in fact, when you do read um, press reports, this is actually um, this is actually a pseudo academic report rather than a press report. This one, but when you actually when you do see when you do read articles from the Irish media, they seem to be really really detailed and they seem to really know what they're talking about. So Neolithic house, an early Bronze Age pit. Well. You can probably understand that uh, maybe the, the Bronze Age pits are towards the left. Um, Neolithic house there, as, as, as explained. And it's saying three phases of archaeological activity were recorded on the site. Now, that, this, is, this is another thing I, I try to avoid using the word phased. 
but it's in this piece. I can't get away with it. So I, I, I don't like using the word phase because it sort of says, well, you know, at 1215 on the on the 14th of August, um, 4000 years ago until until for, for about four days, somebody's building this bit of the building. And then 100 years later, they do something else. And 200 years on from that, they do something else. Phase one, phase two and phase three. Life is never like that because, you know, as as we know, in our own day and age, you know, um, yeah, we, we might we might sort of demolish a wall, a wall inside a house and put a window in and we might sort of close up the door and sort of, you know, all these other things. Right. We can't stop and keep giving them a phase. Um, but I think when archaeologists use the word phase, what they're trying to say is look, the initial stuff started here. Other stuff, other stuff happened in the middle, but then the next big, then the next big stuff is phase two. Loads of stuff happened in the in in the middle of that, and another phase three, and then loads of stuff in the phase four and whatever. But I don't like using the word phase. So three main phases, three main periods of activity on this site, and the earliest phase, um, as as we as we really appreciated, is a Neolithic house and associated features. Um, and there it is, and I call this area two. And uh, looking at the sort of sense of we, we've got these sort of um, various pits and other sort of um, um, sort of cuts, as we call them in archaeology, cuts uh, alongside this around this building. And it's rather interesting, isn't it, that uh, you know if if the ditch had been a bit a bit further, the cut had been a little bit further over towards the right. We would have lost, lost the Neolithic building completely. And again, there's something to remember that the people are always changing things in the past and they're always altering them and they're always developing them. Uh, and this, this, is, this is very much what the past is about. Constant change, constant evolution, constant movement. And sometimes we lose, we lose everything. And... Good example of that is when we look at the the Bronze Age site on a place known as the Great Orm at Landudno, and we know that we know the we know that the cop, people in the Copper Age were mining there, and obviously the Bronze Age, and we know that they're there, they're in the Iron Age, but the problem is the evidence is really limited because later on. There's a there's a Roman period of mining, and then later on there's a more recent period of, of mining, um, and you start to think, well, all of these people have gone in there and they've had their mark and they've changed the site and they moved it. But we 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 do have a little bit of evidence that these localities, that earlier stuff is going on. And what we then find, interestingly enough, is that we that we find post medieval agriculture as well, and I do believe. That's what that is on the right there, post medieval um, activity. So you've got you've got all this stuff going on. So we've got the phase, we've got the we've got the um, Neolithic stuff going on in the center, in the in the main bit of the screen on the left. We've got Bronze Age stuff, and there we've got post medieval. So to give you an idea, we, we've got sort of about um, uh, over uh, four thousand years ago on the left. We've got over 5,000 years in the middle. Um, we've got about um, 400 on the right. And this is one of the things, one of the things that I do see in Ireland, and, and, I, and I never ever say this, but I should say it more often, actually, I really should, that they really seem to take care with their archaeology in Ireland. They really seem to, they really seem to give it a place. Some of the, some of the most um, startling standout bits of archaeology in Britain have been undertaken in Ireland, where, where we've found wonderful organic Viking evidence from about 1,100 years ago in Dublin, where you got sort of really well preserved evidence in, in Dublin, like the Coppergate excavations that um, give us the Yorvik Viking Centre in York. Uh, by the way, I'd just like to mention they've got new excavations, which I do believe are open in York at the uh, at Micklegate again. So hopefully we're going to find more 
in York, we're going to find more medieval uh, Viking evidence as well. Anyway, moving on. So this infrastructure change in Ireland is dominated by the need to get the archaeologists in. And the archaeologists tell us a story of what was there before. And again, it's a story of what was there before that really makes history and archaeology so interesting and so challenging. And what we can say, by building development works in Ireland, we can say that the geographic distribution of Neolithic sites in Ireland has expanded a great deal. And, you know, it's, it says that this site itself is important on a regional level, given that the only, only other excavated example of this site, uh, site type in County Cork, Cork is the one that we've just mentioned. Both these Cork examples produced essentially the same radiocarbon results from approximately um, 6,940 uh, years ago. Um, and then we've got the Barnagor site dating back to dating back to um, 5,928 years ago. Um, and you know these are these are massively important indicators of Neolithic going on. There's really lots going on in the Neolithic um, in Ireland. And I, I just got—I just got to make sure I haven't made a mistake. Um, the, the first uh, radio carbon date I gave, I did, I, I'm, if I may, if I said six thousand um, nine hundred and forty, I meant uh, five thousand nine hundred and forty. So we've got two sites that that have settlement evidence um, dating back to nearly six thousand years. So it's great that we're really starting to see the Neolithic really massively thriving in Ireland. And it's up for debate whether what's happening with Ireland, is it waves of people coming into Ireland, influencing what Ireland, what's going on in Ireland? Is it that really sort of early Mesolithic stuff exploding and sort of giving us this evidence in Ireland? All food for thought. So these building, this building in front of us represents one of the oldest houses in the county and one of the oldest houses in the whole of Ireland. In the North Cork area, there is quite widespread evidence for Neolithic activity. A single pit at a place known as Fumoy, located, located three kilometres to the south of Gortor, um, along the route of the main road, produced 12 sherds of Neolithic globular bowls. Interesting, we'll... we'll, we'll We'll clip, click on to show you what a globular ball looks like now. That'll be nice. So if we, if we, if we click on there, we just go out and chuck in um, a Neolithic globular ball. So here we go. Let's just, um, and we'll do uh, ne Neolithic. And we'll go globular. Glob, you... La oh, let's see what one of these looks like. Let's do it. Neolithic globular bowls. There you go. Um, hang on, let's just make sure I've got the right one. Right, so yeah, that, that's a decorated globular bowl uh, with sort of um, shells in it. Um, and if we go with I do believe that that there, um, number one, is a globular bowl, bowl. That's what a globular bowl looks like. So obviously we need to start looking at, at more of the, these types of pottery because pottery is so massively important in the Neolithic period. It's when we actually start to see a huge explosion of pottery being used in a British context for the first time. We know that this pottery before, in, in the way of sort of heavy clay walled sort of objects, but nothing like this. This is when pottery in the Neolithic period is coming of age. I know when we move from the Mesolithic period into the Neolithic period, I basically said, you know, um, 8,000 years ago, right? 
that there's the boundary between the two. You've got settlement, you've got settlement in the Mesolithic period, but you've got more settlement in the Neolithic period. Uh, you've got um, indications of sort of heavy clay based um, pottery objects in the Mesolithic period, properly portable clay objects in the Neolithic period. That's the difference. Monumental sites in the Neolithic period, really not so much in the Mesolithic period. So there's always these comparisons. Oh, my, mind you, we, we come across cremation in Ireland dating back well in excess of 11,000 11, years ago. That, that, was, that was amazing. So burials isn't really a good indicator of changes within these two societies. So radiocarbon dates are, are very, very important when, when, we're, when we're thinking um, and understanding this sort of wonderful landscape of archaeology. And the evidence combined with the early Bronze Age date with the beaker pottery from the area demonstrates an ele element of con continuity um, in the vicinity over an extended period of time. Continuity. Continuity? Continuity. So well, this, is, this is one of the things that we do find and this is another important point I need to make. We obviously understand that everything's transitional. We, 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 we don't need to go over that again. But, but we don't suddenly wake up in the Neolithic period or the Bronze Age. Yes, we, we know about that. We, we, we've said that before. But what, one, of the, one, of the things that, one of the things that we do find is that people, when they like a place, they seem to live there for a long period of time. They feel comfortable within that landscape. Um, and unless it's being flooded on a constant basis, um, unless it's being flooded on a constant basis, um, you know, your, your, your civilization is going to be happy there. Obviously, the changes with the central Neolithic building there, a bit of Bronze Age with the circle, Bronze Age material on the left, that sort of in thing there on the, um, the post-medieval landscape. And somebody's mentioned online a Steve uh, uh, Beatty, right? Um, nice to meet, you. nice to see you again, Steve. Right? He, I, yeah, I, I'm in contact with him on Facebook. He said that those um, those pottery objects, the globular bowls that we we just saw, um, it's it's shaped quite like a cauldron or even a chalice cup. And it, yeah, people people have come a come of age. You know, they they've got feasts and you know they they need a good old bit of toasting and sort of. Um, and, and that that's sort of the, the, the world that we're sort of seeing um, developing sort of sense of community, family, sort of a sense of person and, and, and people and, 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 and ideas. Um, so what, what we're going to do now is before we go on to the next sub subject and, and the next sort of um, other, other otherness, otherness, these Dean holes, um, and these Denny holes are the Dean holes that, that we're going to look at in a moment. Um, mentioned a jolly cup. Um, we will do with a jolly cup and a drink. Has anyone ever come across um, Dean holes before? Any, yeah. Anyone ever heard of them? No. no. D-E-N-E, Dean holes? No, nope, never heard of them. This is why I wanted to do them, Andy, because nobody had ever heard of them. And, and it's and it's thanks to somebody on 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 Facebook. They um, and again this this not Facebook, uh, YouTube. Some somebody last week that I'd helped them out with with I'd said we'd done a video on this and they watched it. It was actually Doggerland they wanted to watch, and they sent me over a donation uh, of twenty pounds, and I thought that was really nice of them. Um, and then they said, um, do me a favour, mention mention these holes, um, and that's where we're going to go now. And there, there we go. These big holes in the ground. And they're very much associated with chalk. Now, if you look at the other image, chalk, chalky landscape in Ireland. But we're going over to mainland England now. Going down these holes. Now, I've got a reoccurring dream. You wouldn't get me down there for a million quid. Right? I, I just wouldn't do it. I, I just, there's no way. I, I just would not go down there. Um, no way. 
Yeah, I know Pete's going to argue, you're a bloody hypocrite. You did go down a hole in, in Grimes' graves. Yeah, but we had helmets. There was ladders. It was well shoulder. And if anyone was going to die, you were all going to die before me. So uh, don't worry about it, Pete. So um, the, these holes themselves, look at them. Big holes in the ground and they open up. Look at that. Basically, it's for chalk, flint mining, all that type of stuff, you know. Where, and there's these little sort of passage go, they, they, you know, they go into little sort of things under the ground. It's like, wow, I just thought, got to do this. I really, really got to do this. Oh, and, they, and they're blimmin' huge. Uh, look at that there. Cool. Massive. They're blimmin' huge they are. So, so if, we, if we look at this here, and we're going to go down there underground, Let's let's see let's see what we can say about these 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 very very strange things indeed. Um, now, I don't really I don't really know how I don't really know what if it's Denny Hole a Dean Hole or, or but somebody says you should just call it a Dane Hole. Oh, that's all right then. So that's where we'll go. These holes in the ground. Now. It's an underground structure. You can clearly see it's been dug into the ground. It's not sort of something's opened up a fissure in the ground like a sinkhole. It's been clearly carved. So there we go. Yeah, and we're doing this not because it, we're doing this because these must have been accessible um, as, as, as access in the Neolithic period as well. So I thought we'd do this. Um, it's an underground structure consisting of a number of small chalk caves entered by a vertical shaft and there, there there's a young lady going down there and the name is given to certain caves or excavations in england which have been pop popularly supposed to have been created by the Dins or some uh, other of the early northern invaders of the country so saying northern invaders of the country so we must be looking at lincolnshire there as well because that's where they got chalk as well the common spelling Dane Hall uh, is adduced as evidence of this, and individual names such as um, Vortigan's Caves at Margate, so we're obviously we're down on the south coast now, and Canute's uh, Gold Mine near Bexley. Well, I think we can. Uh, I, th I think we can do the um, gold mine at Bexley. Andy, um, gold in Essex is is true. The gold mine in Essex and a chalk, Andy. There it is. It's proved it. it says yeah. a year. Yep. Canute's gold mines. That's what they are. Andy, Andy, th um, there was so much gold down there that they had to get it all out now. And you go down there now, you won't find gold. No, it's all gone. That's big holes. Yeah, makes sense. It's big holes. It's all gone, right? And and the reason why you won't find any gold in, in, in Essex or, or, or Norfolk is because it's all gone. Yep, I can go with that. Stop laughing, Pat. <laughs> oh, hey, the other the, Pete and Adam don't even know what the joke is yet. No, but, no. Uh, <laughs> Andy, should we just tell him just a little bit? You could do, yeah. Should we? I don't think Pat really understands this one, right? Um, it, um, when I when I first met Andy when he was a young boy, um, and this was in. Uh, this was in January, or was it yeah, late December 2011, January 2012, right? Um, 11 years ago. I think we had a discussion of, of uh, the, the, it went, why in, why in Norfolk and Suffolk is there so much gold found, right? Um, there must have been um, gold mines in Norfolk. There must have been gold mines in East Anglia. Because when you think about it, there's so much gold being found down there, right? That when a metal detect goes, a metal detect enthusiast goes detecting on the field, right? Uh, they're probably guaranteed to find a solid gold cork, right? And you go metal detecting in Wales, you're not going to find gold. You're not going to find it. You could go metal detecting in Cornwall, you're not going to find gold. You can go metal detecting in Cumbria, uh, and unless this brings wet mac gold robbery gold you're not going to find it in cumbria right you find all this gold in it in um in that part of the neck of the woods so then me and andy went off on a tangent and we could never find that gold could we andy no no it's there, it's there somewhere 
it's all been dug up, hasn't it? Yeah, it's all been dug up, isn't it, by people yeah. from Wales? But Andy, Andy, we still we're still left with a problem, right? Yeah. Why is it again? We, we this is the question. Why is it in the Iron Age when when gold coins are being produced? More or less, the only gold coins that are being produced in in Britain are being produced by the Ikeni tribe, right? And nobody else is really producing gold coins. Maybe a couple of bastards. It's because they haven't got any, so they got to have it. You see. So, in other words, in other words, that's because they 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 put all the gold in East Anglia into the coins, and that's why there's none there now. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I should explain to the others as well that the, the the joke was we actually looked into the geology and there is no gold in the southeast of England at all. So, <laughs> which, which is quite odd, seeing as lot most of it is there. So, it's, it's again, gets. Yeah, I know what happened, Andy. Well, um, as as you as you well know, fingers crossed, gold is heavy, isn't it? Right, it's very heavy. Um, yeah. So basically, because it was so heavy, it all rolled down to East Anglia, right? <laughs> and, and 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 Andy, use proof, right? Gold mining, gold mines in Wales, hills in uh, Wales. Yeah, it yeah. rolled down from the tops of the hills. Um, your yeah, ivory engine and 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 whatever, right? Yep, it yep. rolled all the way down from the hills. It kept going, right? Um, via glaciation and ended up in East Anglia. Yeah, that that makes sense. The, the tilting of the, of 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 the uh, the whole uh, whole of Britain goes that way, doesn't it? So it would fall yeah, down there. Yeah, it does. Hmm. And, 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 and as um, as Peter, as the both Peters are members of the Flat Earth Society, they will know that occasionally the Earth, because it's completely flat, said you know if 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 a turtle lands on one side of the Earth, it sort of tilts it all, and the gold goes to East Anglia. Have we still got anyone listening to this lecture? <laughs> oh, this lecture. Is it too big? I think no, the Earth's pyramid shaped. <laughs> oh, shut up. Oh, my God. You're not a member of the Pyramid Society, are you? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> right, shut up, everybody. It's Andy's fault. He got me distracted anyway. Um, the caves at Margate and Canute's gold mine near Beckley, right, um, naturally follow uh, the same theory that they're sort of big, long shafts down into the ground. They're scraped out, the chalks um, hollowed out, and the chalks brought to the surface because that's where you're going to find the finest chalk. Uh, the word, however, is probably derived from the Anglo-Saxon den, a hole or valley. Which would make sense. You could, you could, you could hide down here. Yeah? Um, the lack of evidence found in them has led to long arguments as to their function. Oh my God, gold was kept down there; it was nicked. Shut up. Um, the general outline of the formation of these caves is invariably the same, so, which is quite odd, to be honest with you. But then again, if 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 they're um, you know, somebody's saying, are they salt pits? Um, mm, no evidence of salts down there either. The general outline of the formation of these caves is invariably the same. The entrance is a vertical shaft, some one meter in diameter, at which point I'm not going down there. Mind you, right, that's a lot more, that's more than one meter in diameter, isn't it? Um, falling on an average to a depth of 20 meters, 20 meters deep. That is shocking. And do you know what? I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to chuck in here now quickly, right? How did people in the prehistoric know that if you dig deep enough, you're going to come across the best chalk in the country? Big question. The depth is regulated by the depth of the chalk layer from the surface. Although chalk can be found within a few feet or even inches from the surface, a depth from 45 it says six to 80 feet or more is a characteristic feature. This is going over the top, folks. Footholds were cut into the sides of the shaft to allow people to climb in and out. I'm sorry, no way. The shaft, when the chalk is reached, um, widens out into a dome chamber with a roof or chalk some three feet thick. The walls frequently contract somewhat as they 
near the floor. As a rule, the main chamber is 16 to 18 feet is in height beneath each shaft. But so, you know, this is, this is really interesting stuff, to be honest with you. A lot of effort goes into these. From this excessive height, it has been inferred that the caves were not primarily intended for habitations or even hiding places for gold. In most cases, between two or four subchambers are present. Well, hang on a minute. Subchambers, the one at Bexley. It looks like a burial chamber, to be honest with you. It looks, it looks exactly like a burial chamber. Then again, it's not. In most cases, you find two or maybe four chambers excavated laterally from the floor level the roof being supported by pillars of chalk left standing, right? So you, you can you can see that obviously the the chalk needs to be supported. You know, it it, it gives me the heepie jeepies. This does it really really does. You know, I've 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 had nightmares of this type of thing. I'm 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 underground doing an archaeological excavation, right? And and nobody knows where I am, and 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 they and the, and the passage behind me collapses, right? And the reason why that's actually happened to me, more or less, I, I was on a project in Cyprus and um, I, I had a rope. I've told most of you this. I had a rope tied around me. I, I climbed into this passage. I kept going and going and going. And the rope which was tied behind me wasn't long enough. So I undid the rope. Mm -hmm. um, so the people outside were tugging at the rope and they kept put and the rope. They, they pulled the rope completely out. Right. Um, at which point they, 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 were, they were panicking. My radio had packed in. I, I, had a, I had a CB radio down there because I was too deep into the rock. Right. And then I, I, then I had I, then to try and get out, I had to disarticulate my arm. Um, and directly around me was this skin of a snake that had just been shed. So I was panicking. Right. So I had to back myself out of here. And strangely enough, the a woman outside who, who was another Michelle, she come up to me, she punched me in the face, screamed at me and said, don't do that again, you something or other, right? Um, and, I, and I think that's where I get these, this fear of being buried alive underground. Mm -hmm. It makes sense, doesn't it, Pat? Yes. <laughs> Pat, don't allow me to do this, all right? <laughs> There are many underground excavations in the south of England, but there are a few, a few in the Midlands and the north where it's where Lincolnshire, where it can be a bit chalky. And there's another chalk land in the north as well. I think it might be in Yorkshire. I'm not sure. Don't quote me on that. But true den holes are found chiefly in those parts of Kent and Essex um, along the lower banks of the Thames. With one exception, there are no recorded specimens farther east than those at Grey's Thurrock district situated in Hangman's a Wood on the north and one near Chalock on the south side of the river south of Faversham. None of that, that makes no, I, I don't know where the hell we are now anyway. Isolated specimens have been discovered in various parts of Kent and Essex, but the most important groups have, have been in, in Grey's Thurrock and Bexley. There we go. The Bexley and Gravesend, Bexley and Graves Thurrock are the most valuable still existing. It is generally found that the tool work on the roof or ceiling is rougher than that on the walls um, where an upright position could be maintained. So, um, in other words, it's talking about how this is carved and, and those black things are, ch um, are, are chunks of chalk, by the way. Uh, and obviously you can see a collapse there. So th this thing does collapse. Um, and, you know, it, it's. The one, the one thing about this, and 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 you know, I I just really, I, I thought I'd just give you all the gen on these, right? Because I'm loving it, right? Um, and and our our Stephen beat the mentions online. I believe they were bringing salt water or crystals up for creating um, Brown's gas. These tunnels were to bring um, salt springs up when the um, salt water rose in the underground aquifers. That would be, that might be even be a later use. We, you know, we, 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 we're not, we don't know, but that might be a later use. But 
an early use, right? Obviously, well before any of that technical stuff. Thank um, mentioning Steve there. Um, the, these these are actually mentioned by Pliny the Elder. Pliny the Elder. Now, Pliny the Elder in the year um, AD seventy, and Pliny the Elder mentions these these holes in the ground. Um, you know, the Romans were in Britain at that stage, and there was, there's these bloody big holes in the ground. What the hell are they? Um, so archaeological evidence tells us that they these did a, lots of these uh, existed well before the Roman era, um, exploited throughout prehistory. Um, and this is this is where I'm going to go with this being of uh, some of these of being ne Neolithic origin. I've got to go with them of being ne Neolithic origin because Flint was massive. Um, Flint was massive in the Neolithic period, as we know. Um, and it says. Casts taken of some of the pick holes near the roof show that, in all probability, they were made by bone or horn picks. So, in other words, what we're talking about is that the some of these were actually created. Not all of them. Not all of them. I'm not saying all of the, these have been created throughout the ages. As I said at the beginning, I opened by saying that these have been created throughout the ages. But we know we know that um, some of the ones in Essex and Kent right, um, were created using bone or horn picks, the typical tool of the Neolithic individual. These pick holes are amongst the most valuable data for the study of den holes and have existed in fixing the date of their formation to pre-Roman times and obviously used later and so on. You know, people are going to you know, need chalk on fields and so on, which we're going to talk about in a moment. Um, however, uh, very few artifacts which would provide dating evidence or uh, assisted in determining the uses of these prehistoric excavations have been discovered in any of the, den, uh, the known uh, den holes. I'll just mention that um, um, Stephen is actually saying a, a few other things on here. Water levels have dropped and left dry chalk. Chalk is a soft, white, porous, sedimentary, carboniferous rock. It is a form of limestone composed of the mineral calcite and um, and this is what we're going to go on to uh, deep, um, deep under the sea. We're talking. Yeah, obviously, at this, this point now, you know, we're, we're well below sea level. Um, and yes, Stephen, brilliant, Carl. Go with the Neolithic. Uh, love your work. Enjoy. And what we're going to do now, Stephen, is we're going to actually go on to um, some of the other uh, explanations for these things. Um, it said the Cretian de Troy. Um, who, who's writing in the medieval period, Cretan de Troy is actually also writing about King Arthur, um, has a, a passage on caves in Britain, which may have reference to the den holes and tradition of the 1300s treated the den holes of Greys, Andy, as the fabled gold mines of um, Cunnabaline of the early parts of the ADs. So in other words, the den holes of greys are the fabled gold mines of Cunnabaline. Andy, maybe maybe there are gold mines, because this is what Cretian de Troya said. Andy's gone now because well, it is yeah, yeah, Cretian de Troyes a really reliable source, isn't he? he yeah, got, he is, Andy. He's got a load of the Arthurian shut stuff. <laughs> Andy, shut up. Oh, sorry. He's right. <laughs> Andy, Andy, have you ever heard? Have you ever heard of the thing, right? If you can't prove a theory, right, get somebody else to prove it, and we're right. <laughs> Cheers, Andy. You're Absolutely. not good at this, are yeah. you? No, I need to practice more. Yeah, I think you do. So, so what did somebody say to me a few years ago? Archaeologists talk about lies, lies, and more lies. It's true. Um, <laughs> these exist, by the way. They're there. There's Andy there when he had air. Um, in 1225... Henry III gave every man, woman, or hermaphrodite the right to sink a mile pit on his own land. Spreading the chalk on the fields was a common practice in the medieval period. And yes, when you get when you've got acidic ground, like um, lots of ground in Sussex and Kent would be acidic because you know you've you've got iron there. Um, so that that's going to be um, that's going to be um, acidic. So you're going to need chalk to make the ground 
um, neutral and, and, and sort of it, it gives it a ba basic an alkaline base. So this appears to have continued into the 1800s. The need for chalk in agriculture supports the theory that the origin of den holes was for chalk extraction. Uh, except as as Andy claimed earlier on, um, Cretien de Troyes did say it's definitely Connabaline's gold mine down there. Sorry, Andy, I've really put you in it now. Uh, and we've got Vortigern, Vortigern as well. Vortigern's caves at Margate um, are possi possibly den holes, which have been adapted later for other purposes. And excellent examples of various pick holes may have been seen on different parts of the walls. Do you know, we're loving this. Anne's into this. Anne, go down that shaft, right? And find, see if you can find a pick. <laughs> but but when you think about it, you know, when, when we think about history and archaeology, we're, we're looking for like one use, aren't we? Well, um, okay, forget about the gold thing. Um, but we're thinking about this, this chalk thing, but you're thinking, well, there's these holes in the ground. So you might think that local tradition in some cases suggests um, later on, smugglers are using them um, illicit, for, for um, basically illicit trafficking. Uh, they would store the goods down these holes um, and take them up the Thames um, along Barking Creek. Oh, you can't make this up, can you? Barking Creek. Uh, the theory is at least plausible that these ready-made hiding places, which were difficult or, or, of approach and dangerous to um, ascend, descend were used in this way so what what we're, what we're going to do now we're going to we're going to talk a little bit more about these denny holes right we're going to show a picture of Otzi the iceman that andy has modeled for us right um why am i picking on andy tonight i have no idea oh that's because he's had a bad day i'm trying to make it worse um <laughs> right there there you go is it me or what is that person not got a face? Or are we looking at it the wrong way? Never mind. <laughs> Isn't that guy saying, have you got a cup of tea, mate? <laughs> right. By the end of the 1800s, three purposes had been suggested for which den holes may have been originally excavated. As hiding places or dwellings. Storehouses for grain. Grow wells for the extraction of chalk for agricultural uses. And... We're talking about sort of other uses when they're damped down below. We're talking about um, maybe storing water, maybe, maybe sort of other uses as well. Um, uh, thank you, Stephen, there. Um, for several reasons, it is unlikely that they were used as habitations, although they may have been used occasionally as hiding places. Now, I like, personally, I like the idea of silos uh, because if you think about, if you think about, um, if, if you manage to get them in, in, in fairly dry air areas, if you store grain down them, then the alkaline conditions uh, will deal with any bacterial problems. Because as you know, chalk is good for killing lots of various other things. And if you want to get rid of a human body, um, you, you principally use lime, but you could sort of use a, a chalk as well, maybe. Anyway. For several, um, so we're thinking, we're thinking about this. Um, I like the idea of silos, for example, underground storehouses, are well known in the south of Europe and Morocco. When I was excavating in, in Spain at the site of uh, Villaggio de Salvana Santa Maria, um, there, they, there were big grain sil silos in the ground, big, big sort of grain silos cut into the ground. Um, anyway, the, but they weren't that deep. These are really deep. And it's been suggested that grain was stored uh, unthreshed and carefully protected from damp by straw. A curious smoothness of the roof of one of the chambers of the Graves End Twin Chamber, Den Hall, has, has been put forward as additional evidence in support of this theory. Since the 1950s, the theory that they were ancient chalk mines has gained acceptance. So in other words, in other words, over time, people's ideas about these things change. Um, but for me, it's nothing more than, for me, it is when you think about chalk extraction and flint extraction. And that, that's the thing, actually. You, can, I, can I just go off on a little bit of a tangent? Right. And the tangent is Grimes Graves. Right. Now, um, 
Yeah, we, we're going to go off on a tangent. I've got a tangent warning. We'll come back to the den holes in a minute. Sorry, tangent warning. Um, right, Pat, we're going on a tangent, right? We're going to type in Grimes Graves, right? Um, I wasn't going to do this, but I am now. Right, so there we go. There's our globular balls there. Um, so Grimes Graves, right? I'm just going to chuck something at all of us. Grimes Graves, we'll do Grimes Graves again, by the way. That's, a, that's an individual letter in itself even if we ever do um, Otzi the Iceman. That's going down there, right? Me and, me, and, um, me and Pete, the meat went down there, right? You can see where it's all been sort of um, nicely, whatever. We went down the metal ladder, right? Um, and there, this is Grimes Graves. Oh, fiddlesticks, right? Now, this is Grimes Graves, right? I'm on. Right. The theory is, oh, come on, stop it, you tart. Right. This is Grimes Graves. There's a field of owls. It, it looks like um, um, it looks like one of my children's pocked faces after they've had a load of spots. That's a terrible thing to say, isn't it? Anyway, anyway, so um, well, you're looking at that and you're thinking the, the the usual theory is right. You dig a hole, you get the flint out, right? You take it to the surface, and then you you've got a pile and you and you've got another hole. And you put the chalk back into it, right? Yeah, it makes sense, right? But it doesn't make complete sense. And the reason why it doesn't make complete sense, right, is if you've got a big pile of chalk, you've then got to move that chalk into the hole that you want to backfill because you want to dig another hole, right? And the other thing as well is if you can look at this, there are massive dents on the landscape, meaning that they must have also used the chalk for something else in the Neolithic period. Were Neolithic period were Neolithic people spreading chalk on their fields, and that's something that nobody ever talks about, and we just have. Thank you. Does anyone ever watch um, Lisa Tarbuck on BBC Radio Two on a Saturday? I stand in a sound like her. She's off her head. Right. Okay. Uh, Lisa Sab Tarbuck. She's she's mad. Right. Anyway, going back to this. Right. Where's my images? Right. Going back to this. Right. We'll finish on this in a minute. Right. Um. And um, kettle warning. Um, get your kettles on in a few minutes. Right. Okay. Going back to what I was talking about. Denholes. Right. So. So um, now, the reason why they didn't go with these being chalk mines initially uh, was it was reasoned that chalk could have been obtained, um, could have been obtained from the surface, right? But chalk on the surface is not really good quality chalk. The best quality chalk is below the surface and the best flint is from below, below the surface. When we look at the archeological work from Grimes Graves on another date, right? Kent excavation, surveying and research, the whole society, there's the, there's the Den Hole Society in Kent that sort of done a whole thing to do with this, it's a whole society to do with them, right? Uh, excavators surveying and researching Den Holes and concluded that they were excavated in prehistoric, Roman, medieval, and even in post-medieval times in order to produce a supply of unpolluted chalk to spread on fields for the purpose of marling. That's if you're from Cardiff. It's marling if you're from somewhere else. Or, or if you're posh, marling. Um, by excavating a narrow shaft, the miners used up as little of the productive agricultural land as possible. Um, whatever that means. He suggested various other practical issues uh, which supported his um, ideas included that open cast chalk extraction would require moving the material further than necessary and that shallower chalk deposits have much of their minor mineral content leached out by groundwater. Hence why you don't want to dig a massive hole in the ground and create a huge mound. You want to dig out a big hole, shaft, down 20 meters into the ground or 30 meters into the ground, get the best chalk, bring it out, spread it on the field. Bob's your uncle. The hole in the ground isn't a big hole in the ground, and therefore you can use as much of the landscape for agriculture as possible. And Fanny's your aunt. Do you know what I'm going to say? I'm going to make a comment in a minute, right? And there's somebody else has made a comment in line as well. Another theory that has been advanced is that the excavations were made in order to get flints for implements. Well, we, we've already said that, right? Um, now, do you know, I, I think I think this is this is massively intriguing. 
um, the, these den halls. But I think that I think there is one one little thing that that is a bit macabre, right? You know, they've excavated loads of these, and none of the none of the notes tell me that a single human bone or animal bone has been found down them, right? Wouldn't you think? Wouldn't you think? Like, there's a little there's a little roe deer, right? You know, get into this now, and you, a little vulnerable roe deer. There's a, there's a fox behind the roe deer. It's chasing the roe deer across the landscape. And suddenly, the roe deer goes down a hole into the ground, right? And it's stuck there, mining for the fjords. Mummy, mummy. Right, it's an early form of that um, Bambi, right? But it can't get out, and it dies underground, right? That we found no no bones down there, and it's like really weird, you know. What's stopping anything being found? It's just like really, really weird, you know. It's so strange. Anyway, finally, somebody known as Pazu. Thanks, Carl. Really, really interesting. Tons of good chunky lumps of flint among the chalk around here in Suffolk, Essex. So dual purpose, de de decent flint and chalk for farming. Well, obviously, you know, you know one thing, we've done this whole thing right. I've mentioned Flint a fair bit, but none of the writers have really mentioned Flint. And I'm thinking, why didn't you get the chalk and the Flint out of the ground, as I'm saying at Grimes Graves? Um, but the Grimes Graves operations are really different, as you can see, a pop, a pop face landscape. And I'm loving this den holes. Um, and thanks to... Um, um, that, that person who said to do den holes um, a few weeks ago. So what we're going to do, we're going to now look at a, we're going to now look at a photograph of Peter, right? Because Peter modelled Otzi the Ice Man for me. So I'm just going to have a quick, quick drink. Right, we're going to this. this oh, by the way, we'll just have a quick look at these images again quickly before we we go. Again, really wide den hole there. Uh, you can tell that woman's having a bad day, don't you? She did, she doesn't know that somebody's taking a photograph of her, and she's found out that her boyfriend nicked her Mars bar from her lunchbox. Um, next, the, look at that there. You, you're thinking, right, on the surface, extracted chalk. Where's the bloody flint? Nobody's talking about the flint. Thanet sand, sod it. Rope, footholes. Uh, little statue of Lloyd George as you go down, so you can touch Lloyd George and you can really appreciate him. By the way, I found my uh, my my signed photograph of uh, Lloyd jo George earlier on, so that's good. Um, I got to put it back up on the wall. Basket, basket case, um, and you're looking at workbenches to sit down in there. You know, smoke the fag, that type of thing. Um, and and there you got you got these little chambers alongside there. There he is. He, he's uh, he's looking for Lord Lucan. He hasn't found him yet. Maybe that is Lord Lucan. Um, there's Bexley. The Den Hall at Cavi Springs. Thanet Sands. There you go. go going down there. Uh, it's almost as if it's like male, female changing rooms. You know, that type of thing. May maybe this is a porthole into another universe. Adam's into that type of thing. Um, and um, so there, there we go. Look at that. Look at the ceiling there. It's massive. You can even think that uh, Fred Dibner's been down there, can't you? Yeah, Fred Dibner says, you know, what we got to do, uh, we sort of need to go like a um, sort of bell-shaped going down, sort of doing a bit of your work down there. Um, and, uh, oh, hang on a minute. Oh, that's it. Right. Uh, this is uh, Pete. Pete sort of modelled this for me. Uh, that's Pete. Um, five years ago when he, had, when he had hair on his head and a beard. Thank you for that, Pete. Right. As you can see, Pete's really muscular. Um, and this is what how Otzi the Iceman is said to look. Now, I can't really do much justice to Otzi the Iceman tonight because, because I want to do a bit more of Otzi the Iceman again. Uh, loads of little bits and bobs about Otzi the Iceman. Otzi the Iceman is Neolithic, so there we go. Um, Otzi the Iceman um, isn't obviously from Britain. Don't get, that, don't get him mixed up with the Amesbury Archer um, or the man who works in a local ice cream van. And um, and they've got loads of reconstructions of Otzi the Iceman, but this is what they believe that Otzi the Iceman looked like. Very kind, congenial type of bloke, right? Um, and I know Drina would fall in love with him. Right, so on that moment, what we're gonna do, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna have a break now, and uh, we're gonna have a 10 minute break. Uh, I'm gonna have a coffee, because as you know, when I have a coffee, I go completely off my head. Uh, I, 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 uh, Peter, I've just got some niece biscuits. I've got three left and I'm not giving any to you. Um, and that's it. 
right. So what we got to do? We're <clears> gonna <throat> we're gonna move off this and uh, hang on. There we go. Right. First things first. Pat, if you that's okay. Oh, look at Pat's glasses. They look absolutely beautiful. <laughs> These are the ones that are blue or something for screens. All uh, right. Can I ask you a question, right? Have you ever come across a woman in Barry who's from America called um, Kathy Bodette? Nope. You know what it's like. There's only five um, people from America in South Wales. You surely know them all. I know you all meet up. <laughs> Some of us do, but we've been around a long time. We haven't recruited anybody. No, no I can't. I, I can. I can put on an American accent. Oh, fish, fish, fish. right. Nothing else from you, Pat. Okay. Uh, what about you, Margaret? No. Well, I missed about ten minutes. The computer suddenly went off. Oh no! So, uh, <laughs> so I missed a bit about your den holes. I've never heard of them before. Yeah. Well, I, I hope you have now, Margaret. There seems to be holes all over the blooming place, doesn't there? <laughs> of one kind or another. Yeah, well, you've got souterrains in Orkney. I know. Um, you, you have the hole that Boris Johnson's just fallen into. You have the foggy holes in Cornwall. I know. You know have, you only also... just have you only just heard about these den holes? Had you heard of them before? I hadn't heard of them at all. I've got to be honest with you, right? I'm half expecting somebody to come up with something else in the next week as well. well I've never did. come across them. I'd never come across them before in my life. Well, you just wonder what's going to happen next, don't you? Yeah, mm -hmm. it's a you. It's a, it's a, it's like somebody saying that Cornwall, Cornwall, um, is an independent country. You know, you just don't believe it half the time. <laughs> um, right, Peter. What? Yes, you see, it's working. And then the other few talks. Um, I, I only uh, the only thing I thought of. No, I'd never heard of a for a Dane old before either. Um, yeah. But I was just thinking about that picture of Otzi. He didn't have any tattoos. <laughs> oh. And, and the first image that we're going to look at with Otzi the Iceman is where his tattoos are. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got, I got, like, I got to be honest with you, right? You know. Peter, Peter's covered up his tattoos, right? Um, and <laughs> you know, and uh, he, he, he's just kind of covered them up. That's it. That's it. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, and you know, oh, <laughs> by, by the way, um, um, as you all know, John is coming back to the classes. I told them that they start at twelve o'clock at night, and. Uh, <laughs> And if, if, if anyone wants to keep along, if anyone wants to do the class at that time, then they can, uh, they can see John. <laughs> um, it's a shame but... because his wife was really good, wasn't she? <laughs> Margaret, she was, she was okay. She was very knowledgeable. She was. Can she not come back on? Well, yeah, but and she doesn't wear underpants on her head. <laughs> Well, so well, far as we've That's heard. true. Yeah, we didn't notice that. No. <laughs> yeah. Um, what, what about the other Pete? No, I thought the um, the Flintstone in the Grimes Graves. That was solely for flints, wasn't it? And all the all the houses, the churches, their outer walls were uh, covered in flints to protect them from the weather. Mm. Well, the point I was trying to make, and obviously that's obviously later on, but in the early stages, you're talking about flint being extracted from um, Grimes graves. Um, <clears throat> but you are thinking about a lot of chalk didn't end up back down underground, and the, the chalk must have been used for something. When you think about it, Pete, you're taking a lot of bloody effort uh, bringing up the chalk and the uh, and the bloody flint. Right? It, it, for me, it would seem sacrilegious to chuck it back down. Do you know what I mean? Well, the flints are the useful bit. Yeah, but the chalk chalk must have been used as well in the Neolithic period at this time to spread on the fields. It must have been. Mm. I can't understand why. Uh, yeah, but, but 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 Pete, right? In the absence of evidence, let, let me let me explain. Right when when they um when they ex right um the volume of flint coming out isn't massive from these from the locations at Grimes Graves. It's just one layer of flint that they're extracting. The best layer of flint. A crime's graves, right? <clears throat> uh, but to get to it, they've got to take all, take all that chalk out. When you go to places like Grimm's graves, there, there's passages and corridors that that um, has got the original tools in that haven't been backfilled. 
right? So the point is, is that an incredible amount of flint, uh, chalk was not placed back down into these holes at Grimes Graves. That's the point I'm trying to make. So where did it go, Pete? Yeah, you're right. Uh, yes. Well, the only thing they could is spread it on the field, as you say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they were obviously using it for something. Um, right, so, a... Adam, any... Oh, Andy. Um, Sorry, I was going to say, um, whilst we do do a lot of lime spreading on fields, it is unlikely in an area that is lime <laughs> that they'd put it on because it would already be very high in lime. And, and Andy, Andy, this is this is that that sort of a point that sort of kicked me in the head. I'm thinking. But they definitely must have used it for something because it went somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. They would have oh, been yeah. moving. The flint would have been moving across the country. Yeah. So. so yeah. Could they have the yeah. Was. Wow. Could that's an interesting changed? concept, isn't it? Because we don't have any flint where I am. No, we don't have a lot up here we don't either. Have much mm. here, do we? So are we saying that they could have moved um, amounts to chalk as well as flint across the country? Why not? That's it. Why not? No. But yeah, that, that 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 would make sense. That would make sense. Anyway, thanks for that, Andy. Um, mm. Ad, 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 Adam. Yeah, cheers for that. I, the Dane holds uh, very interesting. You know, I lived in the southeast forever and. I've never known they were there, so that's why I would have to investigate that. Maybe not physically. <laughs> no, uh, no, no, yeah. no. But, a uh, yeah, I think, I think it's very interesting. But the, the other thing that I that came to mind um, is when, when you were saying earlier about the culture of archaeology in Ireland, uh, and I'm just wondering, the, you, you mentioned that the attitude's a bit different. I'm wondering what... what um, what, why might that be? What's, what are they doing that we're not? Right. Okay. There's, there's actually. Um, I, I do know a little bit more than I'm letting on. Um, right. There, there's. The, the the problem is the problem is with Ireland is it's got two. It's got two battles, right? Um, it, it's got um, the unofficial history history and the unofficial history versus the unofficial history right and what we what we mean by that is that um when we talk about evidence of any roman stuff in ireland and there's a fair bit is swept under the carpet um, um the other thing as well is is that um <clears throat> where did people in ireland come from Mm. Um, and, and that that's one debate that's never really talked about. Uh, you know, I talk about unofficial history. Nobody ever really talks about where people in Ireland actually ever came from. Right. Nobody talks about that. It's an issue that nobody wants to talk about. Right. Um, and and then sort of um, unofficially, um, there there is a backdrop of trying to explain Irish history with a set narrative. However. The Irish are very good at finding things, and it's almost as if, oh, we found this now. Oh, we'll put it into the narrative. So th there's there's a political motivation behind Irish archaeology, but it seems to absorb what's coming up next, um, which is a bit of a dichotomy. So this is from what I read from from Irish history, um, and you know, it, the one thing that you don't do is upset an Irish museum cu curator in the south. If they've got a set idea, they've got a set idea, but their ideas can change if the motivation for the archaeology allows them to change it. I see. I see. Yeah. Very complex. Very complex answer. Yeah. Oh, um, oh, okay. Thank you, Adam. Um, uh, anything you want to say, David? No, I'm good. And what we're going to do, we're going <clears> to <throat> ask Anne um, if she's got uh, a bagel on. Uh, she's got a bagel cooking. If not, um, anything you want to say, Anne? No, I finished cooking my ciabatta bread already, so that's all in the freezer. Mm. Yeah. Hey, do you know what? I was so I was so, yours, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I anyway, was so close there. Then, anyway, I um, I found it really interesting, especially these den holes, which you'd never heard of. And I always like it when there's an exploration where we don't really know what's happened, and there's lots of questions and. And, and yet there's got to be answers there somewhere, I don't know, but I just find that really interesting to do that, but, but, you know, what might it have been? <laughs> yeah. Can, 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 I, can I just, can I just make, 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 make this observation just quickly? Thank you for that, Anne. It, it's like, well, 
maybe maybe lots of what we've explained maybe there is no one set answer maybe they were used for different things it's yeah. just some which is a way that we do explain history yeah. right um and can i just mention one thing you know when we look at when we look at um pillboxes from the second world war were they mm -hmm. all used for the same purpose or were some used for other purposes Will history say that a pillbox is just used for two guys to stand there all bloody day uh, with with two mole uh, loading uh, rifles from the First World War? Um, or, or were they used for observation? Were, were they were they used um, just to sort of indicate that, you know, we've got a well defended coastline and there's nobody in them, all these different things. And, and when you look at things in the past, it's as distant as our own past today. So. We're going to they take were there it. for observation, weren't they? That's why they had yep. the windows all the way around. Yeah. But the other shutters. thing as well is, Pete, right, have you ever come across somebody who actually spent all day in them and all night, you know? <clears throat> were, were, they, were they continually mined, mound, uh, mined, mound? Were they continually mined on, man, the or, on the ship of rotor sort of thing? Yeah. By the way, <laughs> we always mix lime with... Uh, with sand and cement to, for building at one point. Uh, that's a, one of the uses for the for, for the for the lime. But 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 obviously later on. But there is something else that Pete has uh, just mentioned. One thing that I do talk about a lot, right? And 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 and, and I and, and maybe I shouldn't even be mentioning that at this stage. But <laughs> uh, the next bit of what I'm just about to tell you. Um, one thing I do talk about in the in the Neolithic period is they use they use chalk um, to face banks. So, for example, uh, Silbury Hill uh, is going to be white chalk on the outside. West Kennet Long Barrow, white chalk on the outside to make these things shine. In, in, in very much the same way that Pete mentioned, they used for building, but it was just lots of chalk. Um, where I am in West Wales, and there's no chalk. Guess what we found found find dumped across the field chunks of chalk and the name of this place is is the um the place of the white fort hmm. on that note uh we're gonna we're gonna take a, 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 a very uh, a 10 minute break i will see you in a moment folks okay okay see you in a moment. No. I need to see you. I need to see you because I need to see you because I want your baby. Well, not actually, not actually want your babies to eat. No, I don't want them to eat. No. No, I don't want your babies either, Andy. Not, nor your Pete. In fact, I don't want anyone's babies. I should hope not. You've got enough. Yeah, I know. You know, I'm getting a bit sick of children. <laughs> so you made enough. Can't eat a whole one. Yeah, that's true. I do. That's true. Oh, that's just sick, Andy. Shut I'm quite amazed at their understanding of geology. You know, to, to have worked out that the the uh, the flints at different levels and they have to understand that they can go down and, and to and to dig down where it at. You know, we haven't found holes where there isn't any. So they knew exactly what they were doing. That's what I think. 
I was talking to someone about this the other day about, you know, um, intelligence in early people. Uh, and how everything seems to suggest that they were just as intelligent as we are, if not more so. Uh, and he said, what about love? Do you find any indication of love? And I said, archaeologically, and I thought, oh, that's an interesting one. I never even thought about that before. Yeah, clearly, they had relationships, but whether did, did love exist then or not, I don't know. Well, it probably did. It does now amongst animals, doesn't it? Yep. Don't see why not. Yeah. Uh, I'm fascinated with looking at stuff like that. You know, the, com the common elements that run through thousands of years of humanity are no different. You know, nope. still want the cup of coffee in the morning sort of thing. Or well, maybe not coffee, but <laughs> you know oh. what I mean? Yeah. Is it, is, it the, is it the same as my daughter going to McDonald's with me and insisting that we buy a, a, a beef burger for my pet turkey? <laughs> Do you, know, do you know what? He, he gets a bloody he gets a bur beef burger every bloody time I go to McDonald's now. Deary me, you'd be getting the wrong idea. Yeah, he's it's, not a vegan turkey then. No, he just eats anything. Mm. He's got more sense than his boss. There's a there's no, a lot, lot of birds will eat virtually anything. Surprising amount. Yeah, I knew a woman who could. Uh, oh, we're talking about. Oh, I thought we were talking about women then. No, yeah. no, no. Don't like swimming. What birds don't like swimming? What are you on about? What are you on about? Birds don't like swimming. Why would a turkey go swimming, you silly man? I didn't say that. You said birds don't like swimming. No, I said I don't like swimming. You don't like swimming and you're in the you're saving lives out at sea, you silly man. No, I'm a coast guard. There's a net, it's in the name. Yeah, not and a, Andy. Not and a sea Andy. guard. That's the Aaron and I. I, <laughs> I haven't, okay, I've never seen you standing in mud in, in water then. No, 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 never going it. <laughs> oh, not even being given a medal in the water. Oh, uh, yeah, well, I had to do that, yeah. Yeah, well, exactly. <laughs> they forced me. Oh. <laughs> Do you have a rocket firing station? We did. We did have years ago. We don't anymore. They don't let us have anything fun like that anymore. <laughs> well, Port Leven, where I was born, is that one of the first ones ever? Yeah. Uh, we had the uh, the two pound rocket line, which was really good. Oh yeah. <clears throat> Did I ever work? Yeah. Yes, of course. I had a fire a few. It was really good. You had to make sure you tied off the end of the line rapidly because it went fire went so quickly out of the basket. Yep. And they made them with I a mean, little flotation jacket that fitted on it as well. So if you're firing into water, they would float. It's really clever. And they put the breeches boy on it as well. And yeah. Take people back. Yeah. Yeah. That was rather, I don't know if you've ever tried one, they're rather uncomfortable. Well, I would imagine it would be. But, <laughs> better than dying, yeah. though, yeah. <laughs> that is much better, as you say, than drowning, yeah. Yeah. My brother used... um, recovered the uh, cannons from the HMS Hansen, which uh, was sank off uh, Lou Bar. Mm hmm. Yeah. And uh, he, uh, yeah, they actually recovered the cannon off there, and some of the other artifacts from the uh, uh, from the ship. Mm. But that was fun. Oh, I bet it was. Yeah. yeah. Well, I was down in West Wales at Chapel Bay Port, and there was a, one of the uh, cannon, and the uh, <coughs> George Gear, who was the, uh, the the tour guide there, who owned the place. Um, he said that he was pointing to this and said, oh, this came from HMS Hansen. So uh, I said, well, that, that, my brother probably brought it up to the surface. That's why you've got it. Right. Yeah. That's nice. It was nice. That. Yep. Yeah. He's a very special man, Rich, uh, Peter. All right.
Have I missed anything? Oh yeah. Uh, well, we, 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 well, 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 John, John came on a minute ago. Oh no! Did I miss him? Oh, yeah, sure. John, John, John came on. He, he said, he said to give him your, to give him his love, right? Peter had a huge row with him and asked him to leave, and uh, he's never coming back again. Oh, oh, that's a shame. Because apparently he had your knickers on his head. <laughs> oh, we wouldn't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> oh God! What the hell have I just said? <sighs> I wonder when they started using chalk as a writing implement. Probably throw it away. Perhaps they used to chalk on the rocks, leave one another messages. Maybe they did. Maybe that's where all the chalk went. They sold it. <laughs> <laughs> with, uh, with, with the gold. Yeah. <laughs> perhaps they, oh, perhaps they just kept saying it was gold and everyone believed them because they, <laughs> they hadn't actually seen what gold was. <laughs> uh, yeah, but Andy, I've worked it all out. <laughs> What happened, right? There, there was so much gold around that they used the gold, right, as 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 throwaway beakers to put the chalk in. Right. It it was disposable in in sort of yeah thin had no value because yeah. it was so plentiful. Yeah, it, it had no value and and it, <laughs> yeah. it it was just like thrown away. Yes, but well, we see that in South America. So there'll be a South American connection then, won't there? Oh no, because no, our gold ended up there. You see. Ah, <clears throat> there's a trade triangle there, isn't there? Then, yeah, yeah, but but yeah, but basically, it went it went via um, it, it went via vessels all the way to North America, right? Yeah. They cleared us out, um, and then the Spanish brought it back, and we stole it off the Spanish because it was ours in the first place. Absolutely. So therefore, we didn't steal it. Absolutely, because it was ours. Yeah, good argument. Yeah. Ja, I, I think I think we're good at coming to decent conclusions. Yeah. I'm surprised the Spanish thinking about that. I'm surprised the Spanish haven't asked for it back. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it was ours in the first place, Andy. Can you just That's... get this straight? All right. That'll be why then. Yeah. <laughs> Andy, you and I are going to have to blows one day. <laughs> yeah. Long distance blows. Yeah. Like long distance blows, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. You know, do you know, uh, you know when I, I, I've got no sugar, so what do I use instead? Honey. Honey. honey, what, honey. Use dan what if I use dandruff? No, that won't work. Do you think marmalade Bit dry. Will work? Bit dry. Marmalade. marmalade would work, yeah. It'd give it a bit mm. of a flavouring as well, but it would certainly sweeten it. <laughs> <laughs> that would be rather nice. Marmalade. Sure. Try a bit of chalk. What about a prune? The right colour. Prune. I've got a prune. Prune. Yeah, that'll work. I'll get get your regular too. <laughs> what about what about lactose free soft cheese? Will that do it? No. No. I draw the line at that. Not just right. Like, Not just right prune. if you put a lot in. <laughs> kind of rocky tea. <laughs> Did you say dust mites? Where am I going to get them from? I didn't say dust, I said nuts. Yes. <laughs> nuts like Brazil nuts and cob nuts and things like that. They're sweet. <laughs> Smite people. Yeah. Cashew nuts particularly. Mm. I thought you said, said dust mites. No, that, I don't think that would work, I Carl. Say that. <laughs> what about salad cream? Yeah, well, prob probably would, but it would probably curdle no. though. You'd have to. It would no, have, no, couldn't, very nice. Yeah. Would it? I think dates are probably the sweetest. Yeah, mm -hmm. they're very sweet. No. You put a date in. Ooh, date tea. That could be interesting, couldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I've got three date stones which are growing in my um, in my kitchen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Date palms. Yep. Wow. Well. <laughs> My grandson, he bought some uh, uh, monkey puzzle tree seeds. Yeah. And put them in their, their, their plant pots and asked me to look after them and grow them. But well, they weren't fertile, so nothing happened. Oh. 
I'd had <laughs> some uh, some some dates the stones in, so I stuck the stones out of the dates in the in the pots, and now they've grown. <laughs> He's going to get very confused, isn't he? <laughs> he, is. he certainly is. Yep. Uh, we had uh, we we've got well did have quite a few palms in the village, but that that really cold frost killed most of them. Oh, because uh, the people. Hold on a minute, Andy. If you don't live in a village. You live in a bloody town. You can't call outside a frigging village. It's one of the nicest villages in the country. The Telegraph it's says so. It's not a village. It's a town. Look at the size of it. It's massive. No, it's not actually that big. We well, used to have a programme in the BBC called it a village, didn't they? Yeah. They did. Doing programmes. Villages yeah. by the sea. That's yeah. right. Yeah. So there. <laughs> there were very interesting archaeological pieces of wood opposite the old customs house. Yeah, that nobody knows what the hell they are. No, they, they were there from when they did the sewage works in the 70s. No, they weren't. Oh, were they They'd not? been there a lot longer than that. Yeah. Oh, well, he, he must have been right then. Yeah. yeah. Bloody hell. Right, OK, right, let's get started again, right? Anyway. You can get plenty of tomato plants around the sewage plant. Ah, uh, that's true. Anyway, our friend Stephen online, he said, lime is conductive. Think of the pyramids. Back to electrolysis. Right. Yeah, OK. Oh. Yeah, right. Okay. Right. On that note, let's move on to something else. Right. Okay. What we're going to do, we're going to go on to uh, Otzi the Ice Man, right? And the and 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 the uh, oh, I don't know. Somebody uh, else. Uh, wings. Mm -hmm. Paul McCartney's wings. Andy, were you ever a fan of Paul McCartney and Wings? Uh, I quite liked some of their earlier stuff, and then I got a bit bored with them. In fact, one of the, a band on the run, I quite liked. Oh, we like band on the run. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. Right. The main thing is right. The one, the one thing that that somebody did mention earlier on was Otzi the Ice Man and his tattoos. Right. Mm -hmm. he, he's he's a good looking man. Right. As as we will all agree. And and the thing is right. You know, Gina's going to be upset that she's missed this lecture today because she's yeah. she's she's got she's got a, a a big picture of Otzi the Ice Man above a, a bed. Right. Um, and, you know, she other than um, other than Idris Elba, she's in love with Otzi, the Iceman. It's um, it's not surprising he died, though, is it? I mean, fancy going up a mountain dressed like that. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, maybe may, may, maybe it was a bit cold. I don't know. It was it was. It, I'm sure it was in the summer months they found him anyway. Um, yeah, he's high enough, up to, high enough up to be in, in the ice layer, though. So. Oh. Andy, shut up. He, he must have had a coat. No. Oh, don't don't tell me he had a bloody barber jacket and he just went to Max and Spencer's ten minutes before. Well, he might have done. He was, well, he was in a bit of a hurry, I understand, wasn't he? So he probably maybe not. But hey, maybe he left. Off. Maybe he it's left. Off, it. Yeah. I didn't even know they had Max and Spencer's in Switzerland. <laughs> yeah, well, they probably called it something else in those days. <clears throat> oh right, okay, right. Look, are we going to actually do this? That'd be called it a bear or <laughs> something like that. A yeah. yaki. It would have been a yaki that pinched his coat. No, yeah, you be. stop talking nonsense. I'm supposed to talk nonsense, not you, not you lot. Okay, thank you. Um, is is the is a natural mummy, right? Uh, and we think he lived between the 14th of August at 12:15. 3,350 years BC. And, um, and and we don't know when he died precisely, uh, but it was definitely uh, uh, 12, 18 and four seconds. Um, 3,105 years BC, right? Um, so he, def he was definitely over 200 years old when he died. What? <laughs> Never mind. Um, yeah, but but um, those dates can be right. You should have taken notes right. of this. Is this very accurate, this... Um... This timing. It's not accurate. No, it's not bloody <laughs> accurate. He didn't live. No, no, stop it. Right, anyway, he lived sometime. All right, then, for the sake of Brumman argument, he lived sometime around 5,300 years ago, okay? Are you okay with that? Thank you. Uh -huh. So he was discovered in, in September 1991, and we're going to show you where precisely he was discovered. Smack bang, there, 
on the old Alps. Uh, by the by the way, there, there there was a there was a swine herd up there. There he is. Yeah, there he is. He's, he's looking there. He, he he looks as pleased as punch. He's just killed that deer. Poor oh, bloody old deer. Um, there's there they are. There, look at that. There, he, both of them could have had a bloody shave. Anyway, look. Discovery site of Iceman, right? There it is. Um, by the Brenner Pass. Now, the Brenner Pass was famous, right, in the war between Austria and Hungary and Italy in the First World War. And they're still finding bodies of, of First World War vets. Just suddenly, there he is, full, full sort of gab. Right. Anyway, the biggest problem with Otto the Iceman, right, is where he was found. Basically, uh, the Austrians think he's the, actually the Austrians think he's Austrian. The Italians think he's <coughs> Italian, right? Um, the Swiss can't be asked because they don't want to get involved because they're neutral, right? <coughs> but it, um, the Otzi, 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 the Iceman, right? And this is the thing. And, and the problem is, all these experts saying, we want a bit of Otzi. We want a bit of Otzi. I can remember when Otzi the Iceman was actually found precisely in 1991. Right, because I, I had a I had a good friend, right, um, female friend who I'm not going to mention. Absolutely stunning, Fernanda. She was gorgeous. Right. Anyway, she said she sent me a photograph. I don't know how much you managed to get a photograph. Anyway, she sent me a photograph. She said, "Look at what's being found." I don't know how she had a photograph. Anyway, I did photograph. Otzi the Iceman, a massive, amazing find. But but it was lots of politics involved. And that little triangle there is Luxembourg that nobody ever goes to and nobody cares about anyway. But anyway, so back to this. And the interesting thing is I like this little map right here. And, and Google weren't going to allow me to use it. Um, apparently, I don't know why. Um, but anyway, but um, there it is. Otzi the Iceman, selected Copper Age archaeological sites. So, in other words, Copper Age, right? So, let, let me work this out, right? Otzi the Iceman, the Copper Age in Europe is before our Copper Age, right? But for the sake of argument, right, we're doing the Neolithic at this minute, supposedly. Otzi the Iceman um, fitting nicely in our chronological timeline um, for the um, Neolithic period. But this is in Europe, where they're starting to use copper. Got it? Good. And we know that there's that, that there was evidence of arsenic in his hair. Not anthrax, uh, arsenic. Thank you very much. So um, interesting, from this period that we're talking about, um, over 5,300 years ago, right, um, we find all this other evidence. A site where there's um, a flint site, evidence of uh, flint mining, burial sites, the, the, the purple little efforts uh rock art site there's one there a place called val i i, I knew her well um engrave engraved um stele site engraved stone site stones engraved there you go quite nearby right mm. um and a pile village peter no not pile in west wales oh he's a bit odd you know he's he, pile it's not that pile p-y-l-e it's pile it's pile on posts pile village Right. And can I just mention one thing? Right. A pile village. I, I was I was getting really angry the other day. I, I was with my parents. Right. My mum winds me up anyway. Um, I was with my parents and they had this television program on and it was all these people flooded out in, in Bangladesh. Right. And I said to my parents, if they built their homes on piles, they wouldn't get flooded out. And my mum said, oh, you know, um, it's not their fault they're flooded out. And I said, well, they keep getting flooded down there. So if they built their houses on piles, as they did in the Neolithic period, they would be OK. Right. Um, and that's the point. We've got pile villages, villages alongside lakes that are on piles. Right. Now, we do believe we, we might know where Otzi the Iceman actually originates from. But we'll probably talk about that uh, a little, little, little again. And there you go. There you go. The trade routes all the way from Innsbruck, right? The um, the army brace at Innsbruck, Innsbruck, um, all the way down here. Otzi the Iceman being discovered up in the Alps, the um, Otzdal um, Alps, as in Otzi the Iceman, possible trade route going to Trento and Verona. Know it well. Um, and this itself itself, if we if we go there, 
And the thing is, right, there were all these photographs taken, and, and it's so bizarre how the body was actually found. It, it's just so, so, so bizarre. The body was moved around with ice skis um, and, a, and an ice pick. And the damage on the side of Otzi from an ice pick, believe it or not, uh, they actually thought it was a modern <clears throat> burial. <clears throat> I don't, I don't know. I don't know. How, I don't know our body looking the, the way he did. They, they thought it was a modern burial. I don't know. I just don't know. Yeah. So is the is is Europe's oldest known um, complete natural human mummy um, in this sort of precedent? Right. Obviously, um, obviously the ice has drained um, sort of lots of moisture from from the body. That's why it looks emaciated. <clears throat> so. He hasn't gone into one of those restaurants. They haven't fed him properly. So he's near the present village of um, Felflums in north of Bolzano, Italy. And we do believe he was aged 45. Um, and and, and Otzi, Otzi's other names. Oh, God, here we go. The other names for Otzi are as follows. Frozen Fritz. Tyrolean Iceman, the Frozen Man. I don't know why they called him a Frozen Man. No idea. The Man from Halsjabjok, the Man from Tizenjok, and the Italians called him Mammalia del Simulia or Simulia Man. In other words, Otzi the Iceman. Thank you very much. Um, and we're talking about we're talking about Otzi the Iceman living in the Copper Age. So in other words, he was from a period that we know as the Chalcolithic period. Now, the problem is uh, the, the problem is when when we when we do look at a little bit more um, in, in detail because we've got lots of things to look at in detail, right? So we'll do, do do a bit of an overview today and sort of do what we can do, and then we'll sort of we'll, we'll come back to that, right? <laughs> So, so again, um, so let, let's just let's just look at the, the the basics, right? Due to the presence of an arrowhead embedded in his left shoulder and various other wounds, researchers believe Otzi was murdered. And actually, they didn't find the arrowhead until he was X-rayed, because they couldn't find they couldn't find the wound. They they actually found him after they, they'd X-rayed him, and the nature of his life and the circumstances. Um, of his death and the speculation of much investigation and speculation. Some say there was a fat wire against him. His remains and personal belongings are on exhibit at the South Tyrol Museum of Archaeology in Bolzano, South Tyrol. Now, the one weird thing is they're still finding stuff belonging to him. Mm. So as the ice melts, they're still finding stuff. And I and and um, do you remember that Andy a few years ago? They they were looking at his um his quiver. Um Oh, not yeah, his quiver. Yeah, yeah, yeah they did. And they actually they, they found something on his quiver that they yeah, in the found bottom of it. Before. Yeah, some oh, little yeah. leather pouch or something, wasn't it? Yeah. They found he got cured meat. Yeah, he got that off. He got that off the shelf in um in Liddles. I seem to have heard that recently that they found that he had cured. Either they found it from the strontium from his teeth, or they found traces of this cured meat. Do you know what, right? Why don't you just do the lecture I'll be doing in a few weeks' time? Oh, sorry. You know, so don't, don't worry about it, Margaret. I was just, don't worry, Margaret. You know, it, it was quite harmless. <laughs> uh, no, actually, actually, um, yes, we, we um, I didn't, I wasn't, uh, I know it was cured, but I, I, I wasn't sure whether it was coming from, it, from its teeth. So when we do that, uh, Margaret, we'll definitely have a good look. So when we do watch the Iceman again, Margaret, what we're going to do again, can do all the press reports. I'm going to just do that. So that'll be like, um, this is what we've, the thing is, right, Margaret, the, the, the um, Otzi the Iceman isn't like a Neanderthal man being found, but occasionally we get new stuff about him and it's great. I, I like that. Hmm. I, I like it that we get new stuff and it's, it's like a reminder, isn't it? Um, so Otzi was found on the 19th of September, 1991 by two German tourists at an elevation of 3,210 metres and one millimetre on the east ridge of Finnenswitz in the um, 
Utstel Alps on the Austrian Italian border near Similu Mountain and the Tisjok Pass. Now, it would help if, if we actually put this up on you because I've actually got this. There, there's, there's um, Finjol Spitz. There's what he's found. Oh, where was that other thing I said? Hang on a minute. Well, well, Finjol Spitz. There we go. Oh, the Simul Mountain. There we go. That makes sense, doesn't it? Good. I'm glad we're there. It looks, I wouldn't go up there on a Wednesday, that's for sure. Um, when the tourists, Helmut and Erika Simon, first saw the body, they both believed that they had happened upon a recently deceased mountaineer. Oh. Do you know if we got a question about this, right? Who took the bloody photograph? Do you know what I mean? Is that a mock-up? That's not the actual... That's him! No! Is that... That's him! No! No, 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 no! That's him! And basically, on the left-hand side, you can see the buttock. That's where an ice pick's gone oh. in to wrench him out. Oh! He, he ended up with a... He ended up with an ice pick right in the buttock. Oh, is that Barry Gibb going to visit him? <laughs> yeah, it does look oh. like. <laughs> well, the one, the one with the. <laughs> Shut up, you stupid man! Right, anyway, <laughs> the, the next, the next day, a mountain gendarme and the keeper of the near Simon Hoot um, first attempted to remove the body, which was frozen in ice below the torso using a pneumatic drill and ice axes. Where the freaking hell are you going to get your pneumatic drill up in the bloody mountains? Can you imagine? <laughs> By the way, don't forget to bring the pneumatic drill and a flask of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right, anyway, so in other words, if you think about this, right, the body was actually, it, it wasn't like this at all. So they first attempted to remove the body which was frozen in ice below the torso using a pneumatic drill and ice axes, but had to give up due to bad weather. Within a short time, eight groups visited the site, among whom were mountaineers Hans um, Kammerlander and Renhold Misner. The, are you thinking about this, right? Oh, the, by the way, Let's go and see the ice man. He's up in the mountains. It's fine. We'll go and have a look at him. Right, anyway, the body was extracted on the 22nd of September and salvaged the following day. Now, at that point, at that point, nobody had really collected anything, right? You know, um, and the stuff that they had collected, they hadn't really worked out that the guy wasn't actually a modern mountaineer. Um, so the body was transported to the office of the medical examiner in Innsbruck together with, with other objects found nearby, but nobody at that point had really worked out that the person was anything other than a few years old. And in other words, Margaret, that meant that the body was starting to decay. Ooh. It was put in refrigeration, but it was starting to decay. It was like, um, you know, we don't really need to freeze it, do we? Serious um, dislocation of his left shoulder, isn't there? Yeah, serious dislocation, yeah. Mm -hmm. they, they reckon it, he's like that because, hang on, if we go to another image. Mm -hmm. um, hang on, not that one. Oh, there we go. There. Yeah. yeah. Ouch. These actually show the tattoos, right? Mm. Gosh. So, there's the timeline. They're what? just wearing trainers, those fellas. They wouldn't go up there just in trainers, would they? Oh, hang on a minute. I love that bit of detail. Come on. Haven't they They're just, just wearing trainers, yeah. Yeah. What? <laughs> oh, my God. I never, I've never noticed this before. They're just wearing trainers. Mm. 
I'll tell you what. Anyway, found on the 19th of September. It's now the 24th of September. Stop looking at the trainers. It's your fault. You're distracting me now. Now stop it. Right. Right, there we go. Good. Oh, by, by the way, you can see the damage. That was caused by the ice, ice pick. Can I just make a comment, right? Would you normally take a body out with an ice pick and sort of like do... I tell you what, right? One of my relatives is up in the Alps, right? And somebody goes at the body with an ice pick. On the 24th of September, the find was examined um, there by archaeologist Conrad Splindler of the University of Innsbruck. He dated the find to be at least 4,000 years old on the basis of the typology of an axe among the retrieved objects. So from that moment, they realized that a cock-up had been made and this was of international importance, massive international importance. And then this is when they started setting up research laboratories there. Can you can you see the conversation with those two? Hey, can you can you pass me a, a, a some coffee, please? Uh, what's in the box there? They got pumps, right? Um, he was basically he's basically found in this bit in front, yeah. So that, so they what they did they drained the whole area to try and get they 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 melted the ice to try and get all the objects, and I do believe that yeah, as I said, I do believe stuff is still being found, belonging to Otzi the Iceman, right. They still haven't found the statue of Lloyd George uh, that uh, he took up with him, though, which is a bit of a shame. Uh, tissue samples from the corpse and other accompanying materials were later analysed at several scientific institutions, and it was important that other scientific institutions. It, uh, it was important that other scientific in institutions were involved because of where it was found, because nobody could really work out who actually owned it, right? It, at one stage, the Swiss actually said they belong, they owned it, but you know the Italians and the Austrians actually laughed at them. But anyway, um, it went to several different um, institutions to get um, to make sure that the dates um, put it around at least five thousand years ago. So, the, so um, Conrad Splinter was a thousand years out, which is great because it's better to be a thousand years out one way than it is the other way. So, in other words, it turned out to be one thousand three hundred years older than that. Right to to approximately um, five thousand three hundred and fifty nine years old. Um, more specific estimates stated that there was a sixty six percent chance he died between three thousand two hundred thirty nine and three thousand one hundred one hundred five years BC. He, he was bloody old when he died, wasn't he? He was forty five, by the way. A thirty three percent chance he died between three thousand three hundred fifty nine and three thousand two hundred ninety four years BC, and a one percent chance he died between three thousand two hundred seventy seven and three thousand two hundred sixty eight years BC, which is probably more like it. Now, this border dispute thing is absolutely fascinating. Is when actually is when archaeology actually becomes a subject of an international crisis because the, the the Italians are the Italians and Austrians are saying we want this we want that so this is why they sent all the stuff into different universities so everybody could have a bit now at the treaty of saint germain le um, la um, of 1919 the border between north and south tyrol was defined as the watershed of the rivers in and itched near um, Chinenjok the glacier, which has since retreated. Now, this was the whole point. Because the glacier retreated, right, um, it's important to realise that the ice is melting and that's why the body was revealed, right? Some people say that the body had always been there. Other people say that the body had been moved, right? Um, there's, there's, also, there's also debate on how, how, where the body was actually originally found. Um, because when, they, when the body was when the body was picked out of the ice um it wasn't it wasn't precisely marked where it was originally found hence why they keep finding loads of stuff all over the place although otzi's find site drains to the austrian side surveys in october 1991 showed that the body had been located 92 meters inside italian territory as as defined in 1919 the province of south tyrol claimed property rights but agreed to, to let Innsbruck University finish its scientific exams 
Since 1998, it has been on display at the South Tyrol Museum of Archaeology in Bolzano, the capital of South Tyrol in Italy. But there's still stuff on the old Austrian border. It's, it's a bit, you know, it's, it's a bit really bizarre what's going on here. But you can obviously see the problem that they've got uh, because of this sort of border dispute. But it, but they did actually sensibly. It meant that it meant that more money could be put into it. Actually, if you've got two countries arguing who, who owns it, right? So you've got two pots of whatever to actually pay to have this thing, the body researched. Now I know we haven't got a massive amount of time tonight, so um, the what what I might do. Um, is obviously we're not we're not going to look at clothes. We're not really going to look at tools and all the rest of it. And um, and there's lots of stuff about genetics. There's lots of stuff about blood. What was found in his stomach? Causes of death. Um, loads of stuff. So what it, it might be wise to do for me to just do a little bit more of of just mention a little bit about scientific analysis, a little bit about the body, um, and then maybe. Call, call it a day tonight but I would actually meant I would like to mention that last thing I wanted to do tonight about um, that Neolithic site that we mentioned a couple of weeks ago so I might might do that by the end as well so the, the corpse has been extensively examined measured x-rays and dated so what we need we need that image back again um, there it is Um, my, my um, using um, they they they've used they've used radiocarbon dating they they've used ultrasound uh, they they've used ultrasound was oh, it yeah that's right isn't it um, they they've used X ray uh, they they've done they've done all sorts of testing on on the body um, and in August two thousand and four they actually started to realise that this might not be the only. Iceman up in the Alps because in 2004 they actually found frozen bodies of three Austro-Hungarian soldiers killed during the Battle of San Mateo in 1918. Um, these were found in um, Trentino. One body was sent to a museum in the hope that research on how the environment affected its preservation would help unravel Otzi's past. Now, when you think about it, Otzi the Iceman body is extremely well preserved. You, you can't deny that. Something that, okay, if, if this was, I don't know, um, 100 years old, it, 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 it's bloody well preserved, right? But to be over 5,000 years old is absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing. Um, you know, the, the, the preservationist body. Uh, by current estimates, at the time of death, Otzi was at least five foot three inches tall. Um, is that the height of Drina? <laughs> Isn't it? Is that Drina's height? I'm sure it is. Who's coughing, mm -hmm. sneezing? I don't know. Um, weighed about 50 kilograms. What's 50 kilograms in stone? Can somebody tell me that? No. Come on. Somebody do some calculations. 50 kilograms in stone, whilst I do the rest. Double it roughly, 100. Uh, 110 pounds, 50 kilograms, what's that in stone? Just, just under eight stone. <sighs> right. So that's pretty good for somebody five foot three inches tall, isn't it? When, it, when his body was found, it weighed... Um, Oh, hang on a minute. Rather weighed about and was right. Oh, right. No, it was an estimated weight that they, they reckon it was, would have been 50 kilograms. But because the body itself, um, <laughs> moisture has been drawn out of the body um, due to the actions of the ice. It was believed <clears throat> the body was 50 kilograms when he died, but it was only 13.7 kilograms when the body is in the present state. So originally 50 kilograms when a person died. But eventually, thirteen point seven kilograms, um, because because ice draws moisture out of the body, doesn't it? Um, because the body was covered in ice shortly after his death, it had only partially deteriorated. So there was some deterioration on the on the skull. 
Initial reports claimed that his penis and most of his scrotum were missing, but this was later shown to be unfounded. Uh, well, there you can see he's got something there. Um, analysis of pollen, dust grains, and the isotopic composition of his tooth enamel indicates that he spent his childhood near the present South Tyrol village of Feld Thumbs, north of Balzano. So he's actually not, he's not far away from Balzano now. So if we go to Feld Thumbs, where's Feld Thumbs? Hang on a minute. Where, where's, have we got, there we go. Got Balzano. This has got to be around here somewhere, haven't it? Where is it? I thought it was on you. I thought they had it on the map. Oh, fiddlesticks. Anyway, somewhere about Bolzano, not too far away. Um, there and it obviously, is there, just, um, just to, to the right of it. What, Bolzano? Yeah. It, does it say Feltums, does it? Bolzano. I know. Yes, I said that, you silly man. I said. He came from the village of Felt Thumbs, north of Bolzano. Well, there you are. You said you couldn't see Bolzano. Oh, shut up. Anyway, in 2000, like, we're going back to this, right? We're going back to this. He does look a bit like you, Pete. I'm five foot three, but 16 stone. Oh, fair enough. Uh, anyway, here we go. Um, in, in 2009, a CAT scan revealed that the stomach had shifted upwards in where his lower lung area would normally be. Analysis of the contents revealed the partly digested remains of an ibex, which is basically, I thought that was a frigging goat. That's an ibex. I didn't know ibexes had horns. No, that's a goat. That's not that's an like ibex. A yeah, exactly. You said that was an ibex, Peter. It's not. That's a goat. It's an ibex. Ibex have very long, it's curly ibex horns. To me. Yeah. Andy, don't <laughs> argue with me, right? right that's sorry. an ibex there. It's got <laughs> horns on it. Right. Have ibex got horns on them? Yeah. I did. I didn't know it had horns. Yeah. Horns. Rick Biggins. <laughs> Who? Shut up. Anyway, uh, right. Here we go. Uh, he had, I told you that was an Ibex there. Nobody believed me. There it is. It's an Ibex. Right. Here we go. Conte confirmed by DNA analysis suggested he had a meal less than two hours before his death with a coffee. Uh, wheat grains were also found. It is believed that Otzi most likely had a few slices of a dried fatty meat. Mm. Here we go, Margaret. Probably bacon which came from a wild goat. What? No. No, this can't be right. Probably bacon, which came from a wild goat. Who the hell's written this? It must have been me. You don't get bacon from a goat. Analysis of Otzi's intestinal content showed two meals. The last one consumed about eight hours before his death. Um, uh, one of um, ch chamo meat. I can't even bloody say it. Um, which is like a, which is, yeah, goat. which is like a goat. Chamo, I can't even say it. Uh, the other of red deer and herb bread, both were eaten with roots and fruits. It's the grain also... All right, then. I just, I just realized what you were talking about. Yeah, they're, they're, they're a kind chamois. of goat. Chamois. 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 Yeah, chamois. Chamois. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not doing well now. I should finish. The grain also eaten with both meals was a highly processed einkorn wheat bran, which I've got in the cupboard above. Um, quite possibly eaten in the form of bread in the proximity of the body and thus possibly originating from the Iceman's provisional chaff and grains of icon and barley and seeds of flax and poppy were discovered as well as a kernels of sloes um, and various seeds of berries growing in the wild. Um, so what I'm going to do now, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to um, leave um, anything more about Otzi um, um, for another day. 
Right, but I will mention one little thing. I mentioned that I was going to mention something about the tattoos, right? And the body actually shows, um, you know, where, where the tattoos are, right? Tat there's one tat there, um, a, a few tattoos on his back that we feel were associated with acupuncture, um, and also the ones on his legs. So it goes, Otzi had a, ta a, a total of 61 tattoos, consisted of 19 groups of black lines ranging from one to three millimeters in thickness and seven to 40 millimeters long. These include groups of parallel lines running along the longitudinal ax axis of his body and to both sides of the lumbar spine, as well as a cruciform mark behind the right knee and on the right ankle and the parallel lines around the left wrist. There. The greatest, we, we will do more about these. I'm just giving, because I just said I would do this anyway. Um, the greatest concentration of markings is found on his legs, which together exhibit 12 groups of lines. Now, the problem is, right, the stupid idiot that, that went to, um, uh, that, that attacked his bucket, buttocks with a pickaxe, right? We may have lost more of the tattoos. He may have had some sort of lower part of the lumbar area there, which you can't see. A microscopic exam of samples collected from these tattoos revealed that they, they were created from pigment manufactured out of fireplace ash or, or soot. This pigment was then rubbed into small linear incisions or punctures. It has been suggested that Otzi has been repeatedly tattooed in the same location since the majority of them are quite dark. Uh, so what we're going to do, we'll just have a quick look at some of these images now um, and just sort of slide through them. Obviously, reconstruction of Otzi there. We've been looking at this. There's Otzi with a good old Ibex there looking out. Totally stark naked. Actually, um, I, I'm, I'm, um, there is another reconstruction of him wearing a jacket. And a hat. In fact, there's a hell of a lot wrong with this reconstructed drawing. This is why I wanted to do it again. We've seen that one. There's the location. There, again, give you another closer location of where the body was found. And that area there, which is basically most of the ice is gone now. Uh, but they're, they're, still, they're still melting the ice to actually find more of the artifacts. Um, and there, again, found way up. And he was obviously, lots of reasons why he was there, but that's going to be for another day. Um, and I just want to mention one, one last thing before we go on to questions, because I, I, I know it's getting late. Um, and if, if none of you have got really, really heavy rain and weather, we do. Um, and I just wanted to mention that um, this is for your own research. Look this up. It's a site called Norton, N-O-R-T-O-N, in Hertfordshire. Um, in 1936, a Major Allen, a pioneer of aerial photography in Britain, flew over a field in the east um, of a place known as Lechworth Garden City and spotted a large ring in the crop, which he duly photographed. Like so many such crop marks in North Herefordshire, it was long assumed to be the traces of a ditch that would have formed a quarry for material to make an earlier Bronze Age burial mound. But subsequent photographs realized um, that it was something of Neolithic dates. Um, so they, they've, they've extensively looked at that site at Norton. Uh, and it's a nice little process of uh, reassessing the archaeological evidence. Uh, by looking at the archaeological evidence, by 2004, they realized that the site they were looking at was actually um, a henge monument from the Neolithic period. Um, and that site is a place called Norton in Hertfordshire. So if you if you care to actually look that up on the Internet, um, the geophysics and the story about that, we, we, we've run out of time to do much more about that tonight. But I wanted to mention that briefly. We might come at that site again as we're going to come out, uh, look at Otzi. And what we're going to do now, we are going to call this a day and we're going to see um, we're going to stop. The, we're going to stop for questions now um, and we're going to find out first. From David, if he's got any questions. Oh, no, thank you. It's very interesting. And thank you for that, David. Yeah. I'll see you all. Bye-bye. Bye, David. Bye, David. Bye, David. Bye. I'll see you next week. Thank you, David. No, no, David. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye, David.
Goodbye. Bye, David. Questions. No questions. Oh, you've got to go with you, Pat. Okay, bye. Bye. Okay, bye. I'll see you next week, lovely. Okay. Take care, Pat. Thanks bye, for joining bye. us. Right, okay, so... Um, um, so so the uh, lightweights have gone. They, David oh. and Pat do really well. David and Pat do really well. And, and, um, um, and uh, you know, Pat, Pat and David used to really like to go a lot earlier than this. And I'm, and I'm glad they managed to stay long. I don't know how we managed to do this so much, but we picked so much in. Right. So Adam's got to go to bed next. He's got to be tucked in um, by the little pixies. So we'll do Adam next. Go on, Adam. <laughs> Uh, very interesting call. Uh, no, no questions. So cheers, though. Thank you, Adam. So who's next? Um, here we go. Wait for it, guys. Peter. Uh, Go on. Me? Pete. No. Oh, Pete. No, no questions as such. No. Right, Pete. Very good. Thanks, Pete. Go on, Peter. Pete. Um, only um, I just missed. Who was it who stick that stuck their eye tax and Oxy's? Um, Barry Gibb. Um, <laughs> Barry Gibb. <laughs> it was a, basically a police officer. Oh, right. Okay. Uh, wait, wait, yeah, which was is, discovered. Uh, no, no. Ba ba basic, basically, basically, if we, if we if we run if we run past the story again. Yeah, sorry, um, two, 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 two tourists found it. Helmut and Erica Simon. Right. They it was a bit of controversy because. Um, there's some tampering with the body at this stage. So the next day, the mountain gendarme, a police officer, and the keeper of the nearby Simulut um, first attempted to remove the body, and they were the ones who used a pneumatic drill um, and an, an, an ice axe. So a police officer using an ice axe on the body. Oh, right, okay. I should think they tried to lever it out of the ice, didn't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They thought yeah, it was yeah. a relative set new body, didn't they? Yeah. They didn't yeah, realise did. it was an ancient monument, uh, ancient uh, Didn't notice body. The, the bow and arrow and the stone and the axe and all the rest of it. Yeah. They, 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 they didn't, axe, right? he, they he didn't whacked realize. it right through, though, didn't he? I mean, it's not like he was... It's like he was... If he was trying to lever it out, would you aim right for it? Uh, no, I think, you wouldn't. I, so. I think he yeah. probably tried to get under the hip bone and it, and it just, just ripped and shattered. Yeah. Oh. Good, yeah. yeah, it's a shame. A great well, shame. It would all be very brittle. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I, it's, yeah. It's astonishing they didn't think that it could be any older, I suppose. I don't know. Uh, the thing is, you don't treat a body like that anyway. No, no true. It is a little disrespectful, isn't it? Oh. Right. I think you get proper Who's investigators in. What's that? What's that, uh, Pete? Oh, just that you'd get proper investigators in, because I yeah. assume any any body you'd find, you'd have to treat as as suspicious as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Well, the thing is, exactly, it could have been a bloody murder. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the nineteen nineties, that's really surprising. That, um, I know. Mm. Yeah, it yeah. it is. It a is. European it is. country would do that. Exactly, um, particularly on a border like that. So, yeah. Andy, anything yeah. you'd like to say? Thanks for that, Pete. Uh, no. No, oh, I, I, uh, what, uh, why, I don't quite get why, I, because Ireland has a, 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 in, in the, you know, periods to call them that is they, they, they actually have a, um, a copper period, don't they? Uh, but we don't, as such, do we? Officially, I know there was a bit of it there, but, and I've never quite understood why. I don't think the archaeological establishment liked the idea of having a copper age. <laughs> Wasn't shiny enough. Yeah. Well, yeah, the exactly. Bronze Age, they, they call it the Bronze Age, don't they? Because that's bronze with zinc and copper. Yeah, but, but, but in before, Europe, before they have you that. get, they have both. Yeah. Before you get tin, but before you get tin and copper, you've got copper or a tin yeah. age. Yeah. yeah. Or, or, or you got a lead age, but that's 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 to, yeah exactly. Mm -hmm. And you got a gold age, but but then again, it all disappears Ooh. and nobody knows where it all went from um, yeah. uh, Norfolk. One always right. lives in a golden age, man. Lead and silver quite often came together. Yeah. Mm. I feel like chalk and cheese. Right, okay. Who who else is next? Um, um and Savita. No fascinating stuff, but I haven't got any questions. 
And, and do, you know, do you know, the last person to actually we're going to ask, and she's getting really upset now that I didn't ask her earlier on. You can look at look at look her in the face now. Um, Margaret, go on, go for it. Uh, I'd like to know at some point a bit more about Ox's background, about um, was there tribal warfare? Ah, that's what we're going to do. Mom, yeah, all that. Yeah. And think, family, friends and all the rest of it. Yeah, family. Yeah. Friends. <laughs> was he on Facebook? Yeah. What's his back? What was happening? <laughs> no, he was on Twitter. What was happening ah. in those parts in those days cool. is what I'd like to know. It's well was questionable. He murdered? Was it an accident? Ooh, Did he oh, yeah. Ooh. That's to come. That's it. That's in Otzi Part Two. It's a good story. Otzi <laughs> Part Two. <laughs> the, th the thing is, he he, he was actually a, a member of Saddam Hussein's uh, elite guard, and uh, he ended up going there. Was he thrown there with an avalanche? I'm sure there would have been a few avalanches in that area over no. five thousand years. No, he's right on the top. Is he right at the top? Yeah. Right at the top, yeah. Oh. Right, right, right at the top. He, he had a Royal Navy uniform, just the type of one that Peter used to have. It is surprising he hadn't moved. But yeah. yeah. It is, after all that yeah. time. Mm. It, it, the, the main the main thing about Arthur the Iceman is the incredible age, but it also gives us yeah. hope that there might be other bodies like that. Yeah. yeah. And and the body was found by accident. Um, axe, yeah, good. Axe, it yeah. did. Uh, no, that's not a plan. I'm sorry. <laughs> it, it was found by complete accident. But the thing is, you never know. There may have been other bodies found like this, but they've been ripped apart by by sort of eye animals boxes. and you know like those mm. those eye boxes with the great big horns. Mm. Well, they don't they don't eat meat. No, but they might have tried to lever him out, and that's how his butt got ripped. Not the eye boxes. Yeah. Huh. Oh, shut up, you silly man. The horns are the other way around. <laughs> there may well be other bodies in the in the ice because yeah. that ice preserves it, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, yeah. They, they found a, a woolly mammoth and the uh, the meat of the mammoth was still edible. Mm. Yes. Blimey. Yeah, no, there, there, is, there is talk of eating woolly... Yeah, there is, there is. There, Peter's right. Peter's right. Um... Right, so I got I got to tell quickly before we finish. I got I got to tell you what we're doing next week. Um, I'm just going to look at look at my diary. I, I oh, I guess what we are doing next week. Up to the ice man. No, 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 no. We're doing barrow diggers. Barrow diggers. Oh, we're, doing, we're doing barrow diggers part. Um, Seven, 26. I think. <laughs> We're including doing ten year diggers. old bar barrow diggers. What's that? <laughs> including ten year old bagger uh, barrow diggers. Oh yeah, we won't do the ten year old barrow digger who, who did the barrow in Barry. <laughs> <laughs> Too many beans. Uh, thanks for that, Peter. Don't 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 let me forget it. No, oh, yeah, never. Forget... Yeah, what about the time, Peter? You you and uh, you and. Um, you and Chris used to were sat on the side of the, the bed in your pants watching television. <laughs> I, I'm still traumatised by the image. Possibly too much information there. Uh, Could we do about Stonehenge? It's really interesting. Well, well, as long yeah. as we don't mention Mike Parker Pearson <laughs> once, I will. <laughs> Can I suggest a site to look at at some point? Oh my God! This is this is revolutionary. Can I can I just can I make an observation on something as well, which I'm going to share with you now. One last thing before we end, but before I I share that with you, right? Well, I get the image. Go on, you share a site with me now. It's called uh, the Kist on White Horse Hill on Dartmoor. Oh. It was found a few years ago. Kist White Horse Hill, Dartmoor. Well, I got it written down, and what I'm going to do now, we are. I'm going to. There's there's an archaeological site that I will be. Uh, my my daughter my daughter is actually um. Uh, in in a play, um in um and she's she's doing the lead, which is great. Oh, so yeah. I'll be passing this following monument now. I, I, I'm going to type in. It's near Krakow. And I want there's something that I that I've observed, and I want to 
share with you whilst it's fresh in my head before I, I write it up. There's a, there's a burial chamber on the side of a road going to the little town of Krakow. Right, and here we go. Now, if you look at that, right? You need to share see it. it. You're not All right, hold on a minute, Andy. Well, you're saying you know, if you look at that, we can't see it. Yeah, I, Andy, at least at least you're being observant. Well, you tell us off when we're not. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I, I, can't, I, can't help, I can't help being perfect all the time, Andy. That's true. Right, right, right. Okay, look at oh, this, wow. right? This is right. a burial chamber. It's just by the road. It's a scheduled ancient monument. Now, you tell me, right? how that could have supported a capstone. Mm. There'll be bits of it missing, aren't there? Yeah, but hang on a minute, right? Look, 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 how, thi look how thin the stones are. Could that, have, mm. could that have supported a capstone? Only a, a thin slab one, not, not a great big one like the normal one-piece ones. Yeah. It's very similar it's to the one at Avery. Hang on a minute. Let, let me show you. Um, and, and the one in um, what's it? The one up at, at Keswick there as well. It's got a small one in the middle like that. Uh, as you can see, it's, it's it's by the side of the road. Now, yeah. my 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 thinking is is that um, I'm not really sure it did have a capstone on the, on it in the first place. Might not. No. Doesn't look very and level for one, does it? And the other, the other thing as well is somebody's come up online straight away, a certain person called Kay Higgs, saying stones missing or rearranged. And this is the thing. What, what we are seeing predominantly when we look at Neolithic monuments, we're seeing these monuments being mm. rearranged. Mm. Um, and so we don't really get a complete picture of what's going on. Archaeologists thinking monuments looked a certain way, and they mm. may not have. Um, and it's just it's just food for thought. And there's this growing thing, right? There's this growing thing. And finally, I'm going to show you this. Obviously, obviously, that's a Neolithic site. There's a site called the Giant's Grave. It's called the Giant's Grave on Giant's Grave on the Gower, right? Now, lots of archaeologists, not just me, lots of archaeologists believe that. Um, that this site, if we can, hang on, this, hang on, if we, we're looking, this site here never had a capstone on it because when you go into it, you're going down, you're going down this corridor and hang on a minute, uh, hang on, hang on, it's quite low lying. Um, and we actually, we actually believe that it was just sky burials. It was always, it always remained open. Mm. Uh, there was no capstone on it. Ah, uh, there we go. There, there's a plan of it, right? So you go, you go into it, right? And you got these chambers on the left and the right. Um, and we believe there was never a capstone on it in the first place, because there's there's this tradition growing in archaeology that people didn't want to be buried under capstones. They wanted to be buried out in the open. So they could look up, at, look up the sky as their bodies rot, um, and this idea that bodies are being buried under the ground is 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 an idea that doesn't seem to dominate all burials in the Neolithic period. I just wanted to allow you for food for thought. This is why I was thinking of the one in Crick Owl, uh, mm -hmm. that maybe there may not have been a capstone on it. But we will be coming and looking at this site again. On that moment. Um, we are gonna, we're gonna basically um, stop this, and I'm gonna ask: Is there any other questions before we finish tonight? No, thanks. No, not no. for me. Okay then. Anyway, thank you, Peter, Peter, Adam, Anne, Andy, and Margaret. If there's nothing else you want to say, thank you for uh, staying with us until ten seventeen tonight. Um, and hopefully I will see you all next week. And thank you very much. I'll see you all then. Thanks, Anne. Bye. Bye. Good night. Good night. Good night, night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. See you, Anne. Yes. And apart, give my love to Drina. I will. Yes. 
No, no. Anyway, I'm just going to see if there's anything in the chat box. And that's been great. Thank you, everybody, joining us online. Um, and hopefully Kay Higgs and Stephen and um, there was Pazu. Um, it's not showing that there's anyone watching on my box, but there obviously are. Um, I don't know how many people are watching online. Um, it would be nice to know who's watching online. Just just put your, uh, uh, just put a kiss on there um, so I can know who's watching online because it's showing us no one's watching online, which is really, really strange. Uh, I'm going to say good night now. Don't forget to um, don't forget to like and subscribe. Um, thank you, Pazu. Thank you for joining us. We're we're here next Tuesday at seven thirty. We're here next uh, Wednesday uh, tomorrow at seven fifteen. Uh, thanks for joining us. Thanks for joining us, Kay Higgs and Stephen. Um, we're going to go now. Going to look on the chat box. Always look on the chat box on Zoom because we've got a chat box that you don't see. Nobody's putting anything in our chat box on Zoom. Do, 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 do. Um, and thanks for joining us. Thanks for your support, everybody. Thank you very, very much. I'm going now. Really tired. That's a long, long lecture. Nearly three hours. Take care. Night, night. Bye. Thank you. Thanks for your support. Bye-bye. Night, night. Da -da -da.